All right, here we go. Mob James, welcome back to Vlad TV. Good. It's good to be back, Vlad. Yeah, I mean, this is where you kind of got your start, you know, the beginning of your whole interview career. This is where it happened. Yeah. Right here. Yeah. So you back again. Yeah. As you should be. Well, we got a lot to talk about today. It's been a while since our last interview. And the first thing that we have to talk about is the whole Keefe D situation. Okay. So on July 17th, Keefe's wife's house got raided in Henderson, Nevada. Right. In connection to the Tupac murder. When you found out that that happened, and you actually know the wife. Yeah. I know Paula. There you go. Um, when it happened, were you surprised? No. Why? Well, I've been saying for years, well, when he first started doing the interviews and all that shit, I think this was uh, 2019, when he so-called himself was finna start the book. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was like, that was a bad idea. And I actually told Lil Keefe, his son, Pops need to kick back. Then with Gangster Chronicles, I had him come out to Beverly Hills and we was gonna do something together. And when he got to doing all of these interviews, it was like he need to kick back. But you know, you can't tell a grown man shit. So no, I wasn't shocked at all. I knew he was coming. Well, okay. So we talked about that because Keefe was, you know, we did two interviews with him. Mm -hmm. And uh, our last interview, I talked about that whole thing when he went to G Gangster Chronicles. I thought that there was an interview that was supposed to happen, but he said, nah. He said he showed up and was like, where's the money? After our interview, you went on the Gangster Chronicles and you did an interview with Mob James in the same room. No, I didn't. No? Hell no. Weren't you a Mob James? Were you and Mob James ever in the same room? Yeah, I, I went up to this little studio where he was at. They asked, me, they asked me to get on there. I was like, hell no, where the bread at? Get on that shit. That's no, he, he didn't ask for no money. Him and Lil Keep came, and we, were, we had a proposal on the table that me and him sit down and talk about the mob in the South Side beef and fixing that situation. Mm -hmm. And where do we go from there with the Tupac thing and all the shit that happened that transpired there? And he came, he seemed like he was a little nervous. And I told Lil Keith, here, I'll give you my pistol, hold my pistol. Ain't nobody finna touch nobody in here. And, uh, we talked, he said he wanted to do it. He left, nothing ever happened. Yeah, because after that, I try to get you guys together in the right. same room, and I tried, and I tried, and I tried, and ultimately, it, it didn't happen. Well, even with that, I don't know why he needed security. I come by myself. So it wasn't no problem with me standing in front of him or anybody else. Well, I would have had my own security there. I know that's yeah. Not I would have had actual LAPD or retired LAPD. It would have been a completely safe environment. When you told me that, yeah, I thought he understood that. Yeah, I told that him it that. was going to be security, but I, I guess he didn't want to. He didn't want no parts of it. Okay, so on July seventeenth, the house gets raided. I guess they had seized a gun or something, which I'm sure had nothing to do with the, the Tupac situation. Who's going to keep a gun or some bullets? Not that damn You man. know, 30 years later. So, but I guess they had found like some newspaper clippings and stuff like that around there. Not that it means anything, but it is what it is. You know, <clears throat> you know, to me, I guess the weird part when it comes to these types of situations is like, if you if you you get your house raided and you know that there's a situation that you're involved in especially a murder that you know you're involved in why would you stick around like me personally if if i knew an indictment was coming my way a serious one i would leave the country well i believe he already knew that because he had already talked to metro he had an interview with Metro way before anybody saw it coming. Okay. So when the raid came, one thing we don't do, if you know they've been a raid, you clean house. After they raid, 
you know they coming after you. Right. At that point, I'm not doing no interviews. You can't talk to me about Tupac. I'm not going to say nothing. Now, here you got 20-some years. You free. But you talking to these people. You getting on Vlad. You getting on Art of Dialogue. You giving them the ammunition that they need, even after they raid your house. Well, I don't think he did any interviews after they raided the house. Because... Art of Dialogue. Because he told Art that he got God with him, and he good. He know he good. So he really believed that he couldn't be touched. And, if, and why would you think like that? You're a gang member. You're an a ex-gang member from Compton. You know everything that's going to happen. You done seen this before. You done been to jail. So he just wasn't thinking at all. He wasn't thinking at all. Well, the raid happens, and the grand jury indictments start. Mm-hmm. I know a few people that were questioned during the grand jury. Um, I can't say who it is because I guess there's. Hell, they called. They came. They came to my house. Okay, so they called you. Oh, yeah. They they, they came, came to your house. To my they house. showed up at your house. Yeah, they wanted a uh, a death row shirt with all the guys I had on it. Okay, they wanted that. I wouldn't. I wouldn't give them a shirt. So when they go to talk about Tupac situation, I only mentioned what had happened before, where I was at. Mm -hmm. When they got to Keefe D, I don't know nothing about what Keefe D did, but what he's saying. Right, and just to kind of reiterate, that night you were in Las Vegas. Yeah. You were at Club 662 yeah. doing security. Right. You didn't see Keefe D, you didn't see Orlando. I seen the Cadillac, when the Cadillac pulled up. So you saw the Cadillac? I said, I said the white Cadillac before anybody even mention what kind of car they was in. So you saw a white cat, but you see who was inside? No. Okay. Because it was nighttime. Yeah. Got it. Okay. So you got questioned and you just said, I don't got anything to tell you. Well, I basically told him, I'm raising my grandson. I don't got time to be going to court or going to get involved in this. This man is letting y'all know where he at, where he stand with this. No, man. Leave me alone. <laughs> and then the uh, DA had called me when they was doing the grand jury. Uh -huh. Reggie was supposed to go down there. And uh, when they called, well, can you just, you have a few minutes? I can't tell you no more than what I told the detectives. I don't have nothing to do with that. Uh -huh. Well, your input, you have stated that you saw them there. I just want to place him there. I can't come to court for that. Yeah. So I didn't hear nothing else, and then he got arrested. Right, because technically a white Cadillac is just a white Cadillac. There's probably hundreds of white Cadillacs in Vegas right. on that day. That could have been anybody. It might not have been anybody, but it could have been anybody. <laughs> right? A good lawyer is going to argue that part. Right. Okay, so the grand jury indictment ended up going through. And from what I understand, this is why it took so long, because grand jury indictments is not a one-time thing. It could just keep dragging on for right. weeks, sometimes even months. Right. Which I think is a very unfair system. You don't think so? The fact that a prosecutor can create a grand jury and keep bringing info to the grand jury month after month with no defense... The, the, there's no defense lawyer there saying, okay, this is, no, this has nothing to Ain't do with this. Ain't that how the federal system work? I mean, they doing the same shit. They wanted to make sure they had Keeper D when they came and got him. Yeah. They didn't want no hung juries or none of that shit. So they allowed this man to do what he was doing. So however and how many witnesses they had, and they had, they got a quite a few. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Um... Your video out of or the dialogues and everybody in everywhere he done been interviewed, they got it. It's all public. Yeah. Right. Well, okay, so he gets indicted. And and I just want to say this. One of the grand jurors, I believe, is this guy named Dirt Rock. His homeboy. Yeah. Do you know who that is? Yeah. Do you know him personally? No. Okay. I don't no, they from no. Okay. Got I, I I've heard of him. You heard of him? Yeah. So from what I understand. He was part of the grand jury, 
And what he said was interesting. He said that Orlando was not the shooter. It was actually DeAndre Smith, a.k.a. Big Dre. He said that was the actual shooter. And he said that Dre and him were, I guess, living together at the time. And, and Dre told him the whole story. And according to Dre, he did the shooting, but he didn't want to take public responsibility for killing Tupac. So he allowed Orlando to, to run with the story because it made more sense for Orlando to be the shooter anyways in terms of his street rap and everything else like that. I mean, that's something that they would have to agree on. And for Orlando to be the type of cat he was, I'm not going to take a, a a body and it wouldn't me. Well, he's not technically taking it. It's just the, the reputation. He's no. not good. No. Don't go that way. It doesn't work that way? No. You you if everybody in the hood know you didn't do it, why are you saying you did it? That's the stupidest shit. So <clears throat> Kibby D said itself. Yeah, he said it. I passed the gun, he said, I ain't doing it. I passed the gun, he said, I ain't doing it. Orlando grabbed the pistol and bam. But what does that matter? It's four cats in the car that committed a crime. From where I'm, where I'm from, you going to jail. We all going to jail. It's the same situation right. KBD in now. Everybody knows he didn't pull the trigger, but he's he's facing murder life. Yeah, I mean, but I will say this though. I talked to someone who was in the car behind Tupac when mm -hmm. it happened, who saw the shooting. Okay. And what they said to me. And I brought this up to Keefe in our last interview. Was the arm that they saw sticking out the window was a big, meaty arm. It was not a skinny arm, and Orlando was skinny. Yeah. That's what they said. They didn't say they saw the shooter. They didn't say anything else. And it's not this is not Suge talking, right? This is the car right. behind Suge and Pac. They said the arm they saw was a big arm. It don't matter, though. I mean, you got to look at it. If it was Orlando... Or the other one. It doesn't matter. In terms of what, what Keefe's going through right now. Right. Yeah, it doesn't matter at all. Well, Keefe can say whatever he's saying. The only thing that matters, this dude put himself there. He keep putting himself there. Oh, Tupac was shaking like a... Come on, man. Break dancing. I yeah, break dancing and shit. So it don't matter which one of them cats did it. They all together. They all together. So they committed a fucking murder. And then here you got one out of, out of four talking about this is what happened, this is how it happened. It don't matter who did the shooting. Well, on September 29th, Keefe was arrested in yeah. Las Vegas. Uh, footage of his arrest got released because of the body cam footage. And uh, the cops didn't really even know what they were arresting him for. They just There was a warrant, so they went and got him. And they were like, oh, what are they arresting him for? Keefe was like uh, the biggest case in Vegas history. He almost sounded proud when he was saying it. He sounded proud when he was on your, on on Vlad. He sounded proud. He believed that people now he's recognized. This is why he's doing all these goddamn videos, and that's what killed him. All of these damn videos he's doing, and then you living in Vegas, man. Shut the fuck up. And you making the police look like some goddamn idiots, like they can't do their job. So now, but he ain't paying attention that they're watching him. Yeah. And with all these videos, they sitting there watching it. We got to get this guy. This motherfucker making us look stupid. And he in jail. Well, yeah. He gets arrested. He gets charged with murder. He pled not guilty. Um, from what I understand, the death penalty was taken off the table. That's good. Yeah. But he's 61 years old. 60, 61, 62. Yeah. So unless it's a time served situation or a slap on the wrist, mm -hmm. like probation. Why would they do that? Well, I'm just saying, unless it's that, it's essentially life in prison. It is. Right? You get 10 years. That's why they took life off. He gonna well, do they, that they, anyway. They took the death penalty off. They took the death penalty off. Yeah. But I mean, this is how I feel. At my age now, three months, I'll be four months, I'll be fifty nine. 
if I go out there and commit a murder, that's the rest of my life that's in life. prison. Yeah. If I get 20 years, yeah, that's life. I'm done. Yeah. So I mean, make it worth it. It don't it don't make sense. I think he got cancer or some something going on with him. Well, I think he had cancer. Cause I remember in the beginning, when I did my first interview, he did the BT interview. He said, I think he said he had cancer during that interview. So maybe he thinks at that point that he doesn't have much to live, much time to live. So it is what it is. You know, with me, like he wrote a book. When I did the interview with him, I had the book in my hands already. And that's where people got it fucked up. Yeah, people think that I got him to confess all this stuff and somehow, you know, I had a hidden camera recording him. No, like he sat down just like you're sitting right now. There's four cameras pointing at him, multiple audio, you know, there's, you got to run a wire up your shirt. Like, so you reading out of the book. I'm reading out of the book. We, you know, we read through the book and I have a whole blueprint from the book that I'm essentially navigating the interview with. Okay. So, I mean, people can get mad at me all they want, which they always do, but I'm saying, if you're going to write a book about a crime you did, I have no problems interviewing you based on that book, okay? I didn't just dig you up somewhere with a bunch of information and I'm not putting you on the spot right. and connecting you into a crime that you had no idea that this interview was even about that. No, you wrote a book. You're coming in to talk about the book. The co-writer is sitting right there next to us. You know what I'm saying? Like, it just, it just is what it is. So he pleads not guilty. He was given no bail. Did that surprise you? No. So in these situations, it's always a no bail? It's always a no bail. Why is that? Or the bond is going to be high, a million dollars. They know you can't afford it, so you're going to sit. Yeah. Right. And like I said, he had reached out to me to do a third interview and he wanted a deposit. I paid him a deposit, knowing that I'll probably never see this money again, knowing that there's probably an indictment on the way. But he's just trying to get his money together. So I'm like, all right, fine. Go ahead. Take it. I have no expectations of ever getting it back. I'll never get it back because he gets arrested. But now he's sitting in jail with no bail. At one point, we actually broke the news that he actually didn't have the money for a lawyer. So he needed a court-appointed attorney. Right. Which is crazy to me. He is over... For the court, well, court appointed, uh, he needs a lawyer. He might have action, but going in there with a public defender, yeah, no, for a murder case, yeah, that, 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 that's impossible. And I think he actually did get a lawyer after the fact. His original lawyer, I, I'm not sure, but it's definitely not something a sixty-something year old wants to be in at this point in his life. No. Now, there were rumors floating around that he was attacked in jail. I heard that too. Is there any truth in that? Uh, people that I know, you know, I lived in Vegas. I moved to Vegas in 99. Uh -huh. And I knew a lot of guys out there. I was in the motorcycle club the whole time, the whole thing. And one of my club brothers, a friend of mine, explained, told me that it happened. And then I heard it from Reggie. Okay. So I'm like, okay, that might be true. It might be true. One thing people don't understand, Vegas is different from California, from us. Those cats out there love Tupac. Mm. And I said this, if he go to jail for this, wait till he get to prison. If he get attacked in the, in, 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 in the county, he going to have a problem. Well, he's going to be in state prison. When he go to is, state prison. Which is gang infested. <laughs> It's too many guys that that love Tupac. And then the cold thing about it is these youngsters that ain't never met Tupac when he even here the day he died. 25, 26-year-old kids love Tupac. And and I said to Reggie, he gonna have a problem in jail when they find out he's the guy that killed Tupac. Well, I mean, wouldn't he be in protective custody at that point? I mean, don't you think that the prison would understand? Metro ain't giving a fuck. 
he made a mockery out of them. He made them look stupid for a long time. They ain't trying to put him in no GP. He should be in the medical ward somewhere, even if, if he if he got cancer. He should be somewhere out of the way. No, they ain't giving no fuck. So they're putting him with everyone else. Yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. Well, Las Vegas PD reached out to me multiple times. They're blowing up my phone. They're leaving voicemails. They're calling me over and over again. And I was just, you know, ignoring the calls because I'm like, I don't have to cooperate. Right. And and finally, the detective left a voicemail that basically said that they want all the raw footage from the interviews. And uh, I just never responded. I'm not planning on responding unless I have a subpoena. They're going to come to you. They can come to me, but I don't have to cooperate. No, you don't. That's what I'm saying. And they I'm not can looking subpoena to that, though. And they they, they can try, over. but I don't think they could. I, I'm still the media. Right. You see what I'm saying? So I have protection over giving up. But why do they want that? They already got to know. Well, I, I think what they're thinking is that there's some stuff on there that I haven't put out that they could use in this case. Right. But in my case, you know how my interviews go. Essentially, unless you're coughing or you go to the bathroom, everything is part of what comes out. So th they're barking up a tree where there's nothing there. So it even would, if I did cooperate, they would have nothing. But I'm not, see, my whole thing is like, if you sit down with me and then you get charged with something, I'm not gonna turn around and cooperate against you. Right. Just because I respect the fact that you sit down with me. Right. To me, just my morals won't let me try to throw someone under the bus who sat down and did an interview with me for my platform. Well, you you actually said, and I know they watched this video when you said you solved the case. Yeah. Well, if he, now this is the police thinking. Mm -hmm. Oh, he think he solved the case. Let's, let's link up with him and let's see if we can get more footage from him. Something we ain't seen. Right. So the DA say, go after me. Sure. Make them phone calls. Yeah. And, and when I when I heard you say that, I was like, why Vlad say that? You know how people already think about Vlad, what they think about Vlad. When when Vlad made that statement, you heard everybody. I told y'all, I told y'all his his what you call him was this, I told y'all it was that. So I told Reggie, I just wanted to ask Vlad, what did he mean by that? Because all the dialogue believe the same thing. What happened was you art didn't do nothing wrong. Y'all y'all journalists and y'all sitting here and you reading from the book. So Keepy D know what he's saying. He knows what he responding to. So you can't blab you can't blame Vlad or nobody else he did an interview with because he 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 put himself out there in a situation where he know he couldn't have got out of. So he can't go back to you and say, man, Vlad them know what they was doing. They set me up. No, they didn't. He wrote a book. And everybody out here got to understand it. Yeah. Man, say no if you don't want to talk about it. Yeah, say no comment. It was too late for him to say, man, I don't want to talk about that, dude. I'm cool, dude. I don't. It's too late for that shit. <laughs> was that a keepy the impression? That yeah, was it was. <laughs> That's pretty good, actually. Come on, man. Just, come on. Come on, like, boy. Why are you asking me questions like that? <laughs> but fuck that. You know what I'm saying? You yeah. got to understand, especially from where we come from, you know what you're doing to yourself. Mm -hmm. And the amount of money you're getting paid for these fucking interviews is not going to get you a bond. It's not going to pay for you a lawyer. Yeah, that's true. And you ain't saving this money. So when I seen him in court, and he's waiting another two weeks to, to try to get a lawyer. First thing I said is, damn, man ain't even got the money for a lawyer. Yeah. I, I mean, look, when I say I solved the case, I'm, I'm talking loosely. I'm okay. not the police. I have no ability to solve a case. People don't understand that. Right. Though. The only people that could solve the case is if he goes to court or and gets found guilty or if he pleads out. That's the only way the case gets officially solved. Right. And honestly, a lot of the credit has to go to Greg Cady. He's the one that got the confession and he got the audio of the confession, which essentially 
put everything together. When I say I solved the case, I was the first one to actually sit down with him and get a video of him telling the whole thing from the very right. beginning right. to the during to the after. Right. To the why it happened, who was involved, everything else like that laid out chronologically along with other people kind of you know, different sides of the story from the EDI means right. to the, to the, you know, uh, Chris Carroll, the first responder showing up and everything else like that. I put it together. So to the hip hop world, I solved the case to my It's audience. understandable yeah. how you put it and the way you put it. Because you, I mean, the questions that you asked, Art did a good job too, but the questions you asked, he answered them. And you would sit here and say, Man, this nigga sitting there telling the truth. He just telling on himself. Like, what the fuck? He, he not getting it? He not listening to the questions? So, ain't nobody at fault. The Crips, Compton Crips, was telling him to shut the fuck up. His his own peers was telling him, dude, you need to shut the fuck up. You, you know what you're doing? But it didn't matter to him. You know what I'm saying? So at the end of the day, the only person you can blame is yourself, period. Well, the trial is set for June 3rd, 2024. And he's so going to sit in there all that time. For the next six, seven months, for the next seven months, he's got to sit in this cell dealing with all the Tupac fans that are locked up with him. No bond, no bail until the actual trial unless they come up with some sort of plea deal early on, at which point he'll just go to state prison. A plea deal. Las Vegas do it like this. Las Vegas said, okay, take this 10 to 25. <laughs> That's the only deal we are giving you. It ain't like California, where here they say, take this 15 years, flat. Vegas gonna say 10 to 25, 10 to 19. You gonna sit in there at 19 damn near. So you don't get the 50% that California does? No, they, in the Las they, Vegas, in Nevada? You I mean. get it, but they do the, it's it's like a double jeopardy. You can do your 10, like a life sentence, 10 to five, to five five to life. Then you start going to the board to yeah. see if you can get released. And they keep denying you. They, and, they, and they keep denying you. My boy in jail out there. And he had four to seven, four to eight, something like that. He damn near on his seventh year. Damn. Six years. So they ain't bullshitting. What's the, because I think I incorrectly said California State Prison, because he's I keep forgetting he's in Nevada. So Nevada State Prison, in terms of the gang situation, is it similar to California or is it different? No, they just general prop, general, general population. They they got pretty much the same thing, but are they gonna put KPD? a way where he can't be touched. He don't have no enemies in Las Vegas. So when they go to talk to him, he got to tell him he fear for his life. And then they're going to put him in there in a cell by himself, off the yard. He ain't going to be in GP. Right. So he's going to be in protective custody. And what? That's 23-hour lockdown, one hour walk around in circles. And that's that's a long time to think. At his age. Well, here's the thing. And we talked about this. Uh, I was on Lisa Evers' show on Street Soldiers. It was me um, and a lawyer. And we were kind of talking about the whole case and so forth. And the lawyer said, you know, look, from his point of view, it doesn't seem like there's any sort of new information that Las Vegas PD has. You know, they have the book, they have the interviews. They have the various grand jury people and so forth, but there's no like star witness that's like, you know, I was the fifth person in the car. I was sitting be between Dre and Orlando and I'm going to tell y'all like, no, like, like you said, like they talked to you, but you said, well, I saw a white Cadillac, but I didn't see who was in there. All right. So can't he say, look, I said what I said to Greg Kading because I was facing life over the PCP charge. So I told him what he wanted to hear. And then when the footage got leaked, guys like Vlad and Cam Capone started offering me money to sit down with them. I'm broke. So I just told him 
a bunch of nonsense because I need the money for rent. But I wasn't even there. I wasn't involved. All this is a lie for money and to avoid prison time from whatever, 15 years ago. That's going to be the argument the lawyer makes, right? But you got to look at it. He done implicated and then went to New York to get a bond zip. He done did a lot of outside yeah, shit court of great King, yeah. that's going to tell, see, going to court and fighting cases, you got to prove to the jury that I just needed money and that's the only reason why I do it. They not going to believe that shit. We already guilty when we sit the fuck down. Hmm. So, I mean, he can go that route because he needs something. Yeah. But no, that's no. Well, yeah, I mean, I talked to T.K. Kirkland, who was a regular on my show. Him and Eric Von Zipp lived together. Mm -hmm. They owned a house together, like I think Woodland Hills. And Von Zipp is a known criminal. <laughs> He's known for robbing people. I remember when I interviewed Mike Tyson, Mike Tyson talked about how him and, and Zipp robbed Don King for a big bag of money. We went ahead story about Zipp. So one day, Dog comes and tries this shit with me, put me around six hundred thousand dollars, and then the bag. And you know, believe it or not, six hundred thousand dollars is heavy. I know you guys think if he told you guys grabbing bags like um Tony Montana coming in there, they're not grabbing bags like that. You know what I mean? Like a that might be that might be twelve, eleven pounds. A million bucks is probably like 75 pounds. So mm. It's not something you can run around and run the block with, you know what I mean? So um, it was um, it was crazy when we had all that money, you know? And so, well, we were talking about Don, huh? Yeah. So um, I don't know if I should even say this shit. But um, no, fuck it. Go ahead. <laughs> Ask another question. Fucking zip took zip took like six tip took the six hundred thousand dollars. Really? Yeah. From who? From Dom, and he came in with the money. He's trying to do something, and then zip said, "Zip thought, let's come, let's come back later, and we'll talk yeah. about that." He's walked him out the door. He said, "Hey man, let me get some of that money to pay some people. I got to pay some people." <laughs> WBC, the dog, the dog, come back. He's come back. And zip, you never met zip, have you? I haven't. No. Zip is such a gentleman. It's, dog, it's, please come back. Zip. Not right now. Now he's, he's just not feeling well. Dog, click, click, bye. And then we're thinking about money, like, wow, we gotta have a party. Let's get some bitches. Let's get everything. We gotta do it tonight. That's seven hundred thousand dollars right there. And the story is, was that after Tupac got killed, well, Keefe said that there was a call from Puffy, and Puffy said, "Oh, was that us?" And he right. basically acknowledged it. And the understanding was, according to Keefe, was that Puffy was supposed to pay a million dollars. And the story goes that this money went to Eric Von Zip. Well, Eric kept it. And Eric kept it. Right. Now, I talked to T.K. Kirkland, and I said, well, number one, have you ever been around Zip and Keefe? He said, lots of times. Have you ever been around Puffy and Von Zip? Lots of times. Did Eric Von Zip ever tell you that he knew Keefe? Or have you ever seen the two of them together? We've all been together. Okay, so Eric Von Zip and Keefe 100% know each other. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so so you've just made that connection official. Yeah, yeah, every, yeah we all know each other. Okay. Yeah, it's not a problem. Okay, no, yeah. I, I feel you. And Eric Von Zip, for everyone who's like, oh, he's snitching on Eric. No, Eric has passed away. Yeah, it, no, it's not even snitching. It's just that we hung out. Like, yeah. like I, I, I don't know what happened after we hung out with yeah. their situation, but we all know each other. Like, it's, 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 it's no okay. secret. Okay. Yeah, it's no secret. So, so Keefe saying that he was associating with Eric Von Zip, that's yes, 100% true. I heard that story, yes. That's 100% yes. true. You mm -hmm. have personally seen them together. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Have you ever seen Eric Von Zip and Puffy together? They used to hang together all the time. All the time. Yeah. Have you ever seen Keefe D and Puffy together? No, never. No, okay. Never. Got it. And I'm like, well, the rumor is, is that Puffy gave Zip this million dollars and he kept it and bought a nightclub. He goes, well, I don't know about that, but I do know that Eric Von Zip bought a nightclub <laughs> in Harlem. 
<laughs> called Von Zips <laughs> around that time. The story that Keefe said was that Puffy called him after the murder and said, mm-hmm. was that us? And he, they said yes. And Puffy allegedly sent him a million dollars. They sent it to Eric Von Zip. Mm-hmm. And the story was that Eric Von Zip kept the money. Right. I'd heard he bought a nightclub. Right, he did. He did buy yeah, a nightclub. He did. <laughs> ah, so that part's true. Yeah, yeah. Because zip code. Zip code. It's <laughs> <laughs> called zip code. Did he have money in, in that time frame? I don't know. Right. I don't know. Now, now, if that happened, Eric Von Zip is dead now, by the way. He died of right. cancer some years right. back. So I'm not trying to throw anyone under the bus. Right. It just is what it is at this right. point. You know? If the money never got to Keefe or Orlando, then that kind of protects Puffy to a certain regard. Unless there's some bank transfers that they could prove or whatever else. But I personally, and people have asked me this, you know, because I did like Pierce Morgan and a bunch of other uh, interviews. I'm like, I don't see Puffy being criminally implicated into this thing. What do you think? Too many people are speaking on Puffy right now. You right. got you got everybody <laughs> talking about Puffy right now. Um, and if they don't look at Puffy or the reason why this happened, then they're really not doing their thing. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, with all the shit that dude got going on and and they said he done, this person is dead, that person is dead, I don't know. I really can't say, but I'd be worried if I was him that they just gonna fuck with me. You know, he can, he can afford the good lawyers. He can do that. Oh yeah. But, you know, sometimes lawyer ain't, can't get you out of certain shit. Yeah. And if they really wanna get him, they're gonna go after him. Yeah, I mean, look at Tory Lanez. He went and spent all the money for all the best lawyers, and he's- Still wind up going to jail. I'm doing 10 years right now. Fuck that. Fuck that. So it is what it is, man. Yeah, I mean, I don't, yeah, I, I don't know. Like I said, Puffy's gonna be able to afford the best lawyers. He's gonna completely deny everything, as he should. Well, he can deny it, but you got KVD. <laughs> yeah. We know each other. I ain't no third party here. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. That's what makes it easy for, for the DA because he he got them together. You've got a cooperating witness, and then you got social media putting them together all the time. You hear KBD saying, "Oh yeah, man, he woo woo woo. He ought, he gave me a million dollars, and we bam. Oh, is that us? Come on, man. You both of them implicating themselves, but KBD ain't done. He know more to the story than we do." And and he's going to use it if necessary. Well, that's all, he's, all he has right now, right? So th- that's the only car that he's holding is to implicate a much bigger figure than him, which is Puffy, which, like you said, he's really a villain right now because the whole Cassie situation exactly. and everything else like exactly. that. Exactly. So the difference, it, it really ain't a difference here. You still going to prison, Keep your D. They not gonna let you out just to get puppy. You don't think so? Shit, no. I don't know. See, that, that's a pretty big bag for for a DA, puppy. You know what? They the 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 feds and everybody use this card. I get I got two murders over here. They know it's gonna be hard to prove. But if you give me him and him and him, we will let you walk on this shit. And they only do certain people like that. So just to get what they want, my crimes are forgiven. That's bullshit. That's bullshit. And, you know, KPD just was facing 15 in life in federal, you know, with the shit that he had going on. Mm-hmm. And then now you got a hot one, and then here we are. Now you could bargain your way out of this one? Come on, man. Yeah. It's uh the system is fucked up and they and and they use it how they see fit. Yeah. Yeah, and I remember when when I interviewed Keefe and I asked him why the interview with you didn't happen, he said that all his blood friends told him not to do it. Oh he got blood friends? That's what he said. And that didn't matter to me. 
if 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 he allows somebody to stop him from getting his money and it don't make sense with the shit that he was doing. Now you got some bloods telling you a Compton legend, bloods told me not to do it. Come on, man. I mean, after this situation happened, Orlando, yeah, he was laying low initially, but he was still living in Compton at the time. No, he went in Compton. Oh, I he just he completely was moved. in Long Beach somewhere. Oh, he was in. He was hitting different spots. He okay. wouldn't. He went in Compton at all. No, because people were that know of him was speaking on him and saying his whereabouts. He wouldn't. He went on birds and he went on California. So no, nah, he wasn't just hanging on the, in the hood. So he went to a different city. But Long Beach and Compton, um, yeah, that's not exactly close. It ain't. It ain't too far. It ain't too far. No, nah, it ain't weird. If if I want you, I won't go get you. Yeah. But did nobody have addresses on Orlando? Did you ever see Orlando? After that, no, yeah. not at all. And of course, when he got killed, it had nothing to do with the Tupac situation at all. No, he died how he lived. It's a triple murder over uh, over drug money. The little dude was with the business. And a lot of people don't understand, his name was out there already, you know, from the street shit. So he wasn't finna take shit laying down. So. When he died, how did you feel? I didn't feel nothing. Nothing at all. I don't I didn't have any attachments to him. I didn't break bread, never broke bread with him, never hung with him. He was from the other side. I didn't have no it was like, okay, well, you ain't gotta worry about that one no more. Right, but had you run into him before then, it would have turned into something. Oh yeah, it'd have been totally different. But see, he a youngster. But with his energy, just being an older cat or whatever, you probably wouldn't have had a choice. And I wouldn't have second thought it. I, it would have been just what it is. It would have been on site. Yeah. If he would, if from his energy, banging in it like that, oh, yeah. Right. And, you, and, you were thinking and, about your own safety as well in a situation like oh, that. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm going to get you before you get me. Yeah. Well... Since our last interview, Suge started doing a podcast. <clears throat> Collect calls with Suge Knight. Right. Uh, him and Dave Mays from The Source. They, they actually used some, uh, some AI animation to kind of create the visuals behind it. And um, they talked about you in yeah. the first episode. So, Suge said that you claim you're one of his day one guys and you were not a day one. Then who did he get? Who was there? It wouldn't have happened if it wasn't me. Who did he know that was in it like that? Well, I think he said Buntry? He Suge did not know Buntry. Buntry was doing a nine year bid for attempted murder. He Suge never hung out with Buntry. Ever. Never, never kicked it with Buntry. Suge never kicked it with Rock Chisholm. Suge never hung out with Neckbone. Suge never kicked it with Juju, Shady Grady. Nobody. It was just you. He came to me, yeah. Okay. He said a couple other things about you. He said that you were originally a Crip. Right. Is that true? No. Okay. Why, why that narrative? I got kicked out of Compton Unified in the third grade. For what? Knives, chasing people at school with knives. You were chasing people with knives in third grade? Yeah. So they kicked me out of Compton Unified School. Wait, hold on, hold on. I, I want to talk about this for a second. <laughs> I remember what I was doing in third grade, and, and knives and chasing people was not part of that. Why are you chasing people with knives in third grade? You're, well, you're a little kid at this point. Yeah. You're, hold on, uh, nine years old. 
Right. Yeah. We moved to Compton. What was that? 73, 74. Okay. I go to Stephen C. Foster. And all the guys in there, I'm a new kid. Me, Buntry was in the second. We go to school and I go to my class. These cats picking on me. The next day, they picking on me. I left school, went home, got two butcher knives, came back to school. Butcher knives. Yeah. I got two <laughs> I'm thinking pocket knives. knives. You, you're going all the way to the top with it. Butcher yeah. knives. I went and got two butcher knives and went back to school. And I waited for them to fuck with me again. Wow. And when they started, I started swinging the butcher knives, chasing them. Uh, this one cat, Michael, I'm poking him in his ass as I'm trying to poke him in his ass as I'm chasing him. Uh, they take the knives from me. Uh, police come. They kick me out of school. They sum me to a psychiatrist, all that other shit. <laughs> and uh, they kick me out of the motherfucking district. I couldn't go to... I couldn't go to school there no more. So I had to go to uh, Parma Lee in L.A., okay. which was around the corner from my grandfather's house. And from there, we young cats, we ain't on no game banging shit. So Billy Turnip, C, Run, and all of these other guys were my friends until the gang shit came. When they started being equipped, this is where Paru came in, but I stayed friends with the majority of mm -hmm. the gang banging shit didn't interfere with that. So by me having and being around those guys, Runt being my my best one of my best friends from Kitchen Crip, I don't know where she'll get I was a Kitchen Crip. Right, yeah. He said you were a Kitchen Crip. Didn't he call you James Williams? Yeah. Who is, who is my James grandfather Williams? and my mother maiden name is Williams. Okay. James Williams, when he when he when he used this fictitious bitch to get my driver license, a fake license, I'm on parole. So they got a license for me and James Williams. Okay. And that's where he got that shit from. Okay. <laughs> so convoluted, man. All right. No, he's just a stupid <laughs> motherfucker. Don't know shit. And, and I mean, he was saying outrageous shit. I lived in a garage, an uh, alcoholic. Shook, if I was anything of that, how did I get to you? You know what I'm saying? And if I was that off the edge, Shook wouldn't have made it as far as he did. Well, he also said that the reason that you don't like Tupac was that Pac, he said Pac put you on his on your pockets? What does that even mean? Saying Pac knocked me out. Boy, let me tell you something. If Tupac would have touched me, Suge also said him and my brother Buntry laughed at it. If my brother wouldn't have whooped Tupac ass for knocking me out and sucking Suge in his goddamn mouth, I'd have got up, I'd have shot Buntry, I'd have shot Tupac, and I'd have shot Suge. And I'd have shot Tupac again. You would have shot your own brother. Yeah. I shot my baby brother. <laughs> I forgot about that. That was an accident, but that was an accident though. Yeah, but <laughs> you don't think hell yeah, I'd have shot him. Because he laughed at you and didn't step in for you getting that's my blood. We didn't we didn't get out like that. And just think, if Tupac would have did that to me, how am I in a position to bodyguard or watch any of these other cats? Tupac would have been on, on, on the A1 list. And nobody in Compton would ever believe that dumb shit. I'd have beat it. They'd have had a problem. Well, Suge also said free Keefy D. And he also said that Keefy was not the shooter. For whatever reason Suge have been in a position that he's in, say what the fuck you want. You behind bars. Yeah. Say what you want. You want to prove to the cat next to you that you ain't with the bullshit? Didn't do that. But she got to look at it like this. You had a whole hood 
behind you, out there fighting, shooting, and doing everything else, putting their life on the line for you. Keep your deacon honestly tell you, I saw the bullet go in his head. I, I thought he was dead. And yeah. then you'll go and say, this dumb shit, everybody and their mama, every, every, all the homies, it's like that nigga out of line for that. So you pretty much telling us, fuck us, and what we did for your scary ass, and hear you saying freedom and, and, and this and that. No, he went against the grain on that one. Do you ever see, you know, because look, Suge got 28 years. Right. Right. Out of those 28, realistically, California State Prison, how much time do you think he'll actually do? Before it all depends if he gave him 80, but I heard he got 10 more. 10 more. So they probably knocked something off. Okay. But Suge is in his mid 50s right now. Suge is 58 years old. 58 years old. Getting out of 68, I'm sure, is not something he's looking forward to. He ain't got no choice. Well, but here's my point he does have, you know, a feather in his pocket, which is potentially cooperating in this Keefe D case. Because from what Keefe said, him and Suge locked eyes. He said, I, I, I've known Suge since high school. We played, you know, football together, whatever else. Suge is the only living person that could actually put Keefe in that car, right? In terms of a witness. Keefe D already said me and Suge locked eyes. I understand that. That puts him in the car. I understand that. But Suge, but he could come back and say, well, I just said that to get some money. If Suge corroborates that, then at that point, Keefe's cooked. Right. right. If Suge says, yes, I saw Keefe D in that car, and the reason why I knew it was Keefe is because we grew up together, we played football together, you know, I mean, whatever, whatever, we've been to each other's homes, we go back. If he does that, then that would be a, almost 100% conviction of Keefe D, sure. and it might work out a deal, say, listen, you do this, we'll let you out right now. Right. Could happen. I know it's state and and... You know, it's California, no, Nevada, can't, can't, but you know, you know how these deals go. They, they can't knock off 10 years and say, you can you can walk out of here. But I, I see where you're man. I, I've seen these, I mean, I don't, I've interviewed Sammy the Bull. He got a few years for like 10 bodies. Right. <laughs> but he cooperated against everyone. He took the stand against anything they asked him to do. Right. So I, I've seen these types of things happen, especially for a high that. profile. But knowing Suge, do you think, Suge has never cooperated, by the way. He had never do it. He'll never do it. He'd rather sit in jail yeah. for the next decade and come out an old man. That bitch, he, he ain't going to do that. He can say free keep your D all day, but he ain't going to do that. Why do you think he won't do it? Uh, I know Suge. Suge ain't going to do that. But Suge, as we've talked about, didn't grow up a gang member. He, he became, you know, once he became rich and he he surrounded himself with that, but this is not what he came from. Right. Right? right. He had a two-parent home. He played football. His dad had a pool in the back of his house. You know what I'm saying? Like, he, he went to college, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But yet, He's still sticking to the story and he's not cooperating. He's still being that that street That's guy. Suge. He, Suge. One thing Suge did get from being around Buncher and all of us, and Suge know the streets. He know the streets. And that's he's not gonna do that. Period. I know he ain't gonna do that. So he's gonna keep that to himself. That's one thing I get at bitch. He ain't gonna do that. What about when Keefe D dies? What about when he dies? Do you think that Suge will come clean as to what happened about Keefe D after he dies? To the police? Yeah. I don't know. He might. When the motherfucker died, he ain't, what you call him? It, shit, it's possible. Right, because think about it. Keefe D cooperated against Orlando after he died. Right. Not to say that Suge and you know, Keefe are the same person, but... Well, see, in the streets, everybody know what the fuck is going on. And Suge know what the fuck is going on because we were at war with another gang because of what Suge was saying, where we was going with that. 
And then for him to go where he went with it, it's just like, what the fuck? But everybody knew what's happening. And this shit I can't say, but you know, everybody know what the fuck is going on. And so they should. You know, a lot of this is is the re your reasoning why everything was going the way it was fucking going because of what you were doing with Puppy. You know, his bullshit. You know what I'm saying? And behind us, you 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 having meetings with these motherfuckers. But you, it's so many people that was losing their life behind his coward ass bullshit. So, you know, can't nobody tell me shit about Suge Knight. He full of shit. But one thing he ain't gonna do is fuck with the police. Yeah, I remember I had Michael Jai White on the show. Mm -hmm. And uh he said this one time, he had met Shook before, but it was a while ago, so I don't think Shook remembered who he was. But you know, Michael's a big. Oh, I watch all his little movies. Yeah. Uh, what's that, Blood and Bones? Blood and Bones, he'll outlaw Johnny I Black, his new one. Check yeah. out his new one. Oh, you got a new one out? New one, yeah, it's, it's a Western movie. Yeah, I like him. Yeah, but you know, he's he's a good friend of mine. He lives right around here. He's on my show all the time. And he's a big, strong yeah, yeah. dude. He's a yeah. martial artist, anything else like that. And he told me about this one time he was in Malibu, and he saw Suge just like hanging out by like, by like a balcony or something at, at a restaurant. So he wa he starts walking towards Suge just to say what's up to him. And he said Suge saw him and didn't recognize him. He said Suge was getting ready to just jump over the balcony thinking that he was about to, to, to attack him. And when he got close, he's like, yo, Suge, what's up? And Michael, uh, he's like, oh, okay. But he said that like, Suge got, Suge didn't have all his guys with him and everything right. else like that. Then my girl at the time takes me out to, we go to Joffrey's in, in Malibu. And um, the, uh, the um, maitre d' is taking us this way. But I happen to see Suge and his, his wife, or I don't know who it was, at the balcony area outside. And so immediately they're walking this way and I'm like so surprised to see him. And he was just in a jovial mood. Like he was just kind of, you know, just looked like he was just having fun. He was out there. And I was just so surprised. And I just, I walked toward him. And he turned as I was walking toward him. And he goes, he like bristles. And he kind of looks over the back. And I went. Like he was oh. about to jump off. Like, I didn't know what was, but he just was like, he got real tense. And I, and I walked up and I'm like, hey. And I kind of grabbed him on the shoulders like, you, you okay? He goes, yo, man. <laughs> he says, I'm out here chilling with my lady or whatever. And I see you walking up. And he says, instantly, he just sees threat. Yeah. Right? I was like, yeah, but we got no beef. He says, yeah, but I didn't. I had to. He said, like, he had to, like, put it together. Like, yo, do we have beef? Like, and so I was like, no, we ain't got no beef. But it was a funny moment. Because he was saying, the last thing I thought was I, I see somebody threatening walking toward me out here. And it was as we both laughed about it. I mean, listen, Suge's human. Anyone can get, I mean, Suge's gotten knocked out. Suge's gotten shot. Like, it's, you know, just like the rest of us can get knocked out and shot. It's, it's different with Suge didn't say, okay, I need y'all to shoot me so I can be a gangster. He didn't know he was going to get shot. Uh, I've had, I've had Suge in so many situations where I could have did something to Suge. It was so easy for me to be mad at him opposed to hang out with him because I was getting a check. Mm -hmm. Motherfucker, I'm coming to the office. You got something to say? I, I, I see you up there. He won't be there, but my check will. You know what I'm saying? I know what type of cat Suge is. It wasn't Suge, it was the twins, his cousins. So we've been in a lot of shit, me and Suge since from 88 until bunch of got out of prison. Sugar has been, I ain't gonna put my foot on his neck no more, but you know, the shit that dude said on, on his podcast pissed me the fuck off. So I say, fuck Suge. Suge is, I, he ain't that dude. He ain't that dude for him to even be talking. I bet you if Suge was on the street right now, Suge wouldn't say shit, half of the shit that he's saying. You know what I'm saying? So 
Me personally, I'm gonna let him be a pussy. You are who you are, and whoever believes Suge is this and that, I'm here to tell y'all, Suge ain't never had a red rag in his pocket. Suge ain't never carried a goddamn gun. Suge ain't never did shit. Suge was in the house before dark. Miriam was. He ain't that motherfucker. So for him to be talking like that, maybe I, man, just gonna put that nigga out there. I ain't gonna do it. But I can tell everybody that he ain't punking me, and he never have. And none of the cats that were were assigned to him. You know what I'm saying? He ain't talk shit to Buntry. He ain't talk shit to Neckbone. None of these dudes. So all that shit he doing behind bars is, is a fucking joke, man. You know what I'm saying? This Keepy D shit, the only reason why he's saying that, I got Crips on this side. I got a Crip on this side. I got two bloods on this motherfucker with me. Maybe I can save face and I'll never testify. I'll never this. Even in jail, you ain't that motherfucker because you wouldn't be in no, you'll be, on, you'll be out there walking the yard if you was that motherfucker. You just a big dude. I mean, what is Shug's situation in prison? Is he in protective custody or is he in general population? He in protective custody. Okay. Shug has, Shug has stepped on a lot of motherfuckers. And there's a lot of motherfuckers that that lost their lives or are in jail. We got homies in jail right now that Suge was a fucking afraid of. And you know, I ain't gonna even say that. That Suge was afraid of and couldn't do nothing to. Rock Chisholm, what's up, my nigga? Couldn't fuck with him. When Suge say, turn your cars in, Rock told him, fuck you. And sold a motherfucking car. You know what I'm saying? We had homies that was fighting against each other, stabbing each other for this clown. But they didn't want to listen to Mob James, the one that drank. They was listening to this fool. But we got homies getting killed. So Shug is, he good where he at. I think I did something with, I believe it was uh, Chris Blanchard. Remember from Channel 11? Mm -mm, no. From Channel 11 News, Chris Blanchard did a story and when my brother was killed. And I basically just told Suge to stay the fuck away from my family. You know what I'm saying? So when he continued to fuck with my brother, I went after him. I went up to the office looking for him. I went there for him. You know what I'm saying? So Suge needs to tell those stories instead of this bullshit he's doing. Yo, fuck your podcast. Keep it 100 on your podcast. Because I'm going to keep it 100 on this shit. So it is what it is. Well, Suge said that Keefe is safer in jail than he is on the street. No, he's not. But on the street, he was perfectly fine. He was living his life going where he want to go. Right. He's not safer in jail. I mean, in fact, if what you're saying is true, he's been attacked in jail, whereas on the outside, no one's touched him. No, no one touched him. Nobody was going to touch him. Yeah. You know, uh, jail is a different story, a different conversation. Shook should understand that and know that by now. He's been to jail so many times. Uh, the conversation is totally different in there than on the streets. You know what I'm saying? It can happen either or. But Keepy D wasn't moving around like that. He wouldn't out popping champagne in public doing this and that. You know what I'm saying? So he was good. Yeah. Well, Suge also called Warren G a liar and uh, went through the whole thing. You were around Warren G. Yeah. I mean, Warren G was... From what I understand, I've interviewed Warren G before. Like, he was Dre's stepbrother. Right. But he wasn't really accepted into death row like that. And I remember he told me that the real, you know, the moment he realized that he needs to go was they were going on some big tour and he showed up at the airport and there was no ticket for him. Right. So he was like, all right, I got to go do my shit on my own. He went and got the deal with Def Jam and then he blew up. Right. You know, the regulator and everything else like that. But I guess 
you know, based on an interview that Warren did on Drink Champs, she called him a liar and everything else like that. What exactly was that about? Warren G basically saying, let's get my nigga out of jail. Suge don't want nobody to take credit for that. He wants the credit for that. Suge is basically a big old baby, man. If he can't have his way, he going to start talking like this, whether it makes sense or not. And and I wouldn't I wouldn't with Warren G when he said, let's get him out of jail. Suge don't know how much money he had. Suge didn't put up $2 million cash to get to do what he did. It didn't work that way. So why Warren G couldn't have did it that way? You know what I'm saying? So Suge wants the credit. Let Suge have the credit. And and but how you gonna tell this dude what he wasn't gonna do? You know what I'm saying? That's Suge. If Suge can't have his way, he start crying. Well, on a different podcast, uh, he talked about the whole situation with Snoop and the shooting that happened and the bodyguard. Right. Um, he said he spent six million dollars to keep you know, Snoop from going to prison for life. That amount seems pretty high. I can't imagine. I don't know anyone that spent six million on it. I don't think OJ spent six million on his case. You know what? I could blow shit gas out of the water, but it, a lot of shit went on. And after Snoop Dogg then won that case, they had the jury and everybody else celebrating with us. Eating big old motherfucking potatoes, this big lobster. <laughs> eating. Yeah. They kicked it with us. The jury. A few of them. Yeah. Yeah. One jury got up and did his rap song about the fucking case. <laughs> and I, I, I ain't gonna, I ain't gonna say more. <laughs> sure, you know, where the, where the camera at? Motherfucker quit. So, okay. Snoop don't owe him shit. Now he did, he did do his thing with it. And and because he hired us to come up there and make sure Snoop was good, uh, David Kenner. Did he did he give Kenner six million dollars to do Snoop and they coming up that motherfucker together? No. Yeah, that number just seems no. He didn't do that. Way too high. And I've, I've interviewed uh, you know Snoop's bodyguard, right? Who got off as well? Malik. Malik, exactly. And I guess didn't Shook say that? He had 100 Crips of Bloods outside the courtroom. He had 100 who? 100 Crips of Bloods outside the courtroom during Snoop's trial. Who had that? Suge said he had that. Suge ain't had no motherfucking... Suge, Suge got at me and uh -huh. told me, get some of the homies. The Crips is coming up here scaring Snoop. Because the, the guy who got killed was a Crip. Yeah. No, his homeboys was coming up there first. Yeah. And they was worried about that. So I said, okay. He told me to get 15, 20 homies. I had nine and me. That's it. So 10 people. That's it. Did anyone show up in that courtroom causing trouble? Not or one. Or the court, the courthouse or nothing? Nobody, not one time since we was there. Not one Those gang member came up Quiet there. the whole time. Period. The easiest money I ever made. Okay. Because I guess Sugar told a story about how Snoop's bodyguard Malik got got beat up at a video shoot mm -hmm. uh, in Long Beach around the time of, of the murder. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I heard about that. What happened? Oh, so you weren't there? No, I wasn't there. But no. what'd you hear? No, just Malik got into it. Um, I heard about the crib dude that supposed to banged on him or whatever. They was driving and they shot the dude, whatever. That's their personal shit. I never got into nothing that went on with Long Beach or none of them crib dudes. All of them guys that worked at Death Road, they'll tell you, Mob James wasn't around them. I was a motherfucking gangbanger. I wasn't hanging with them niggas. Mm -hmm. But if it came to me getting paid, I'm going to make sure nobody touched that crib. That's, that was my job. I never kicked it. My brother and them smoked weed with Snoop them every day. Got high with them, drinking, whatever. I never kicked it with Daz and Corrupt. The only one that I know that was like, fuck that, I ain't going out like that, was Corrupt. And I said, well, y'all can't be mad at him standing up for himself. And that was one conversation. That's the only one I speak on. What do you mean? So what did Corrupt do? Well, that? you know how Death Row, you had the hood there. And, and the homies was, was them, being them. And right, so you had all the Pyru Bloods, and then you had all Long, Long, Beach, Long Crip. Beach Crips. Right. Now, 
Corrupt was a Roll Sixties crip. I didn't I didn't know that at the time. Yeah, yeah, I thought he, he, he was came from up, Long Beach. He came up under a big U. Yeah. So well, he was, Roland, he was a crip, but, but, uh, but a Roll Sixties crip. He right. was a Long Beach crip. I thought he was from two one with Snoop and no, all of them. No, dudes. but but they were fucking with each no, other. I'm talking so. about back then. Yeah. So I didn't really trip off of Snoop being from Long Beach or whatever. I never heard Snoop cripping the way he cripping. I never heard him cuz, 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 cuz. I never heard that. So that ain't part of my job to bang on them. You know what I'm saying? Just like Tupac. It, it wasn't my, that wasn't my job. But I'm not gonna hang with you and fight people and do all that other dumb shit you doing because you think you this cat or you wanna be from the hood. You ain't from the hood, and that's the only beef I had with Tupac. You ain't the homie. You not from Compton. You you didn't you ain't killed nobody in this motherfucker. You ain't gang banged on another hood. So how the fuck you think you from the hood? That's motherfucking Trayvon bullshit. That's Buntry bullshit. Y'all that this nigga ain't from the hood. Well, well Suge said that. Tupac did more for for the hood than like all these guys. He he was more of a Nino Brown, yeah, feeding, giving out turkeys. Yeah, but he ain't did nothing else. Right, and I wouldn't that dude. I I'm not the turkey man. I ain't got money like that. <laughs> well, was was Pac actually like ever officially mob Piru? Was he jumped in or anything else like that? Cause no, because he, he had mob tattooed on his I, arm I, at one point. Man, there's a lot of cats out there doing that bullshit just right. coming to a hood just to fit in with a clique. But no. Was was MC Hammer around when you were around? Hammer was at doing Snoop Dogg trial. Yeah, he was around too. Okay, did you interact with him at all? Yeah, I had a dance off with him at the Snoop Nim one. <laughs> Look, it's funny, and I hope that nigga remember. He was dancing and shit, and then you know I'm a little freaky dancing and shit, doing my little thug shit, right? And he dancing, I'm dancing, and I, I got a video. It's a video out there that. Uh, we was leaving the function, and I was saying, how many want to fuck with me? How many don't want to fuck with me? And it, we was just out there, we was fucking around. Everybody was happy, Tupac off the shit, and we was chilling, and we had a little dance off and shit. That motherfucker can dance. You know I can't it's fuck MC with Hammer, him. man. Yeah, exactly. That's what he's known for. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, we fucking around, but yeah, Hammer, Hammer was cool. You know, I never saw Hammer in no bullshit or on, on some bullshit. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, you know, he was from Oakland. Yeah. I mean, although, although I've interviewed people that basically said that Hammer was a menace <laughs> at one point. Like, like I remember, uh, what was it? MC Search said that uh, Hammer put a, put some money on his head. So when they came to LA, all these, you know, I don't know if it was Crips or Bloods, but I think it was Crips was always trying to get at him. And then, you know, uh, Red Man ended up dissing on my song, and he said the hammer rolled up on him like a hundred deep. It was like, I'm sorry, hey, Mr. Hammer. He like, probably was with yeah. the business, you know? I'm, yeah, exactly. I never kicked it with him like that. Okay. Um, Shook said that he stopped Dre from uh, getting a bunch of jail time from beating up a bunch of women. I believe that. I believe that, but... I mean, there's the D. Barnes situation, which is, right. you know, th that that's actually, you know... In the paperwork, but was the other was and you know Michelle A claimed that Dre beat her up a bunch of times. Did you ever see that? See him beat her up? Yeah. No, I wouldn't. No. Okay. Have you seen him get rough with women in general? Yeah. Really? Dre, Dre, he beat up a woman, but he ain't gonna beat up no dude. I ain't never heard him beating up or or talking shit like that goddamn movie they did. He was beating up us. Never happened. Okay, so. Tell me when you saw Dre get rough with a woman. I can't do that. I, Dre, father's conversation, he was very disrespectful to women. Michelet, her, he was disrespectful, you know, and and even should. Me, you know, a, a, a female couldn't tell me shit at that time. And I think that's the same position they was in. But... Sugar said many times how Dre whooped on her ass because she was drunk. Or Dre beat up, uh, what's the name on the, uh, what's that fucking rap show they had? The D-Chick? D-Barnes. Yeah. 
uh, got at her because she said something out of line to him. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I've never seen him interact with a dude like that. I took his goddamn car. He didn't have no problem with me. You took Dre's car? Yeah. I took his, the chronic, the one that he got in the video. I took that, that motherfucker. The, the Impala? Yeah. Okay. I took that, parked it in my yard, and, and Shugnam came to get the motherfucker. I told him, there, go right there. Hmm. Just go through my gate and touch it. <laughs> Just touch the motherfucker. So what you're saying is you've seen Dre beat up a woman, but you're not going to talk about that situation. No, I don't want to talk. No, Fair enough. I ain't going to say I've seen Dre beat up no woman. I've said I haven't seen him talk disrespectful. Okay. Fair enough. Well, another thing that Suge said was that his mom died while he was in county jail. Right. Did you know Suge's mom? Yeah. You guys? Yeah, I, his mama, his daddy, his sister and them. Yeah, I know them. Yeah, Suge lived right around the corner from us. He said that was rough because he said that him and his mom were really close. They he were. Said, he said to the point where on Mother's Day, she would go see him, not his other siblings. Now, he's the one that obviously made it in that family, and I'm sure he bought her a house and gave her, you know, I mean, allowed her to kind of retire and everything else like that. No, you're saying that's not true? You're saying with all the money that Suge gave away, Mother's Day, lunches, and all that stuff, he didn't take care of his mom I'm gonna like that? I'm going to say Suge was full of shit, and, and his mom and daddy had to move when while he was in jail, when moms passed, pops had to move. That they didn't own that house. The place that they lived in, it wasn't theirs. Really? And I'ma just say Suge was full of shit. I ain't gonna put his business out there because he ain't never spoke on my mother. You know what I'm saying? But he disrespected my mother. You know what I'm saying? But Suge, if people just knew Suge, then they'd they they'd be happy that he's in jail. They'd be like, fuck him. Why you think Wack 100 came to his rescue? Suge was full of shit. They didn't have money, but Suge had money. They didn't know how much money Suge was making. Suge family went well off in the octa hood. But you're telling me, with the hundreds of millions of dollars floating through death row records, his parents still lived in the hood. He I, 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 can't, I can't. Look, I, he moved I, them I, I off. I can't imagine. Let me explain this to you. Okay. He moved off Orchard. He moved them off Orchard into another place, a home that's supposed to have been theirs. That motherfucking home wasn't paid for. And then he lost their mama in them house. He didn't sell a motherfucker. His sister and them wasn't living good. Motherfuckers need to tell the truth about this clown, and he shouldn't have never spoke on me. His family wasn't well off. Did he give did he give the brother in laws jobs? He did that. But at the end of the day, they just like us. Went back to where we were and broke. Okay. Well, I mean, he said that basically on Mother's Day, they wouldn't let him talk to his mother, and then his mother took it hard. She went to the hospital and I guess she died shortly after. I can I can believe that. Suge had a very good relationship with his mama and his father. Yeah. And Mom's mom, his mama kept him out of harm's way a lot of times. Suge had a good goddamn mama. And like I said, I can't, I can't, man, that she was a good woman. She was a good, she was a good mama. And Suge, Suge was a mama's boy. He loved his mama, and I believe that. And and I would have took it hard if I was sitting in jail and my mom's passed away. Yeah. So I can believe that. And I would have took that rough. I would have took that hard. Well, he said that uh Easy E's uh widow, uh Tamika, messed up a billion dollar deal, you know, for Dr. Dre, because I guess he offered her a dollar out of everything that Dre does for the rest of his life and she turned it down. The story doesn't sound right. It just simply doesn't sound right because I don't think you could make a deal like that. Because uh, I don't think she 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 can't have tell Dre to sign off something for the rest of his life. Like he just doesn't. Because he's like, oh, had he done it, 
you know, easy would have, you know, the easy's foundation, you know, I mean, estate would have made money off Eminem and his beats by Dre. I'm like, this just doesn't sound right. If, if Suge would have had something in that for himself, I can see that. Well, I'm sure, I'm sure that was part of the deal, but I'm saying like, did you ever interact with Tamika or Easy No, Ease? no, 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 no. I no. never, I never, I never, business was Suge shit. I never interact with his business, but Suge is a shark. Suge took advantage of people that, that were, were, that were scared. And Suge took shit, just like with Dre in this case, why he's in jail now. Dre walked away from death row. Let him go. Suge keeps everything. Now Dre and them doing a the movie, Dre got money. Suge don't have money. I'm finna get at this motherfucker right. and I'm finna get some money out of him. Yeah, but that, that didn't work out. It didn't work out. So now you're interacting with somebody that's on your level or maybe a little tougher, well, a little tougher than you. And it didn't happen. So he wasn't able to extort Dre and get Dre. If it was somebody else, he probably would have. If the homies were still with Suge at that time, he probably could have did that. Well, he talked about a situation, Suge, that he was having like some sort of after party club, you know, party or something like that, and a fight started to break out between MC8 and DJ Quick. Do you know about this at all? I ain't. I ain't okay, so so that. what what he said was. MCA DJ Quick were there. They started to kind of get into it with each other. And there was a dude who was with MC8 who was down with the rolling 60s. And Suge basically was like, y'all need to just go outside with this shit. Don't, don't fight in here or whatever else. They went outside and the guy from the rolling 60s ended up getting killed. I was there at that. You know what I'm talking about? All the homies was there at that. The boy that got stabbed. Okay. Yeah. So you know about the situation. Yeah, I was there. So describe to me what happened. All, when 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 it broke out, it broke out fast. DJ Quick started throwing shit. All the homies started fighting different individuals. No, okay, was DJ Quick down with y'all or was he just there by himself? No, he was with everybody. He was with us. He was Because DJ us, Quick was fucking with Death Row at one point. Yeah, yeah, all of us was together. So okay. that 60 pounds and all that bullshit, throw that shit out the window. All of us was there together. And he had got into it with, with, with a cat. I didn't know if they was Crips or whatever. And then now you hear cats throwing up and saying they hoods. So all the homies doing that. Now at the end of the day, everybody in there drinking and all this shit. So it went haywire. Me and Suge was at the stage. And I stayed at the foot of the, the stage while Suge and some chick was up there. So Suge didn't get into that. Yeah. Well, he, didn't he, he, he didn't say he was, he was getting into yeah. it. He actually was trying to get everyone out. Right. No, he wouldn't he was on the stage. He wasn't trying to do shit. Okay. The police let the shit happen. The security that was there couldn't do shit. Mm. It was too many people. It was too many people when it was it was chairs, bottles, and everything else, glass and everything else thrown in that motherfucker. Okay. And then somebody from MC8 side ends up getting killed. The 60 guy. Yeah, they're all in 60s. Right. Who was so yeah. Where the entrance was, he was like damn near where the, where the door was at, and he was just laying there. Now everybody is coming out of the motherfucker, running out of there, boom, 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 boom. They actually, the police contacted James McDonald, Alton McDonald, and Timothy McDonald to come into the police station mm -hmm. to, to be questioned. It was like, God damn, I didn't know my name, my brother name, and my other brother name. These the only motherfuckers. Because right, you were involved in this fight at all. I was watching Shug on the stage. You were, you were his security. Yeah. yeah, so why is we the only three that's being questioned? Mm -hmm. Damn, that was crazy. Okay. So here goes Shug. I think Big U got into the situation or somehow. It was a rolling 60s thing. Yeah. yeah. So, I know they gave the mother flowers and well, he he claimed that he gave the victim's family two hundred fifty thousand dollars. He said they tried to sue him, and he just gave him two hundred fifty thousand. I don't believe it was two hundred fifty thousand dollars. That's what he said, because he said in in the podcast that he had actually met at one point like the daughter of the guy, and she was like, "Hey, why did you 
kill my daddy. And he goes, well, I didn't kill your daddy, but I did give this money to your family that's been helping you out all these years. I knew he that's gave the story money. He, that's the story he told on I his podcast. I know he gave money, and I know he sent the mother some flowers, which sending flowers or whatever, situation happened, happened on your watch. It's only right that you make sure whatever. And I don't think nobody was tripping off of that. I think everybody got to tripping. Well, we didn't even know to what extent the money thing came because now I'm it's Big U. Big U pressed him and got eighty thousand dollars out of him. So he oh, didn't gave him eighty thousand. Yeah, that's what you heard. Yeah. So I mean, you got the money, pay your way, do whatever the fuck you gonna do. It, I didn't, it, I didn't care about none of that. But when he did that. Here you got Bloods Against Crips, and you making sure the Crips get buried. But when the homies was passed away, uh, Andre Johnson, Big Hook, when he died, you was like, you ain't paying for that funeral. But you'll go and pay. It was totally the opposite bullshit with Shug. He know. I got to make this right because a lot of heat going to come to him. Because the big you. Yeah. And his, and his uh, role in L.A. Right. So. Uh, did, did they ever, was anyone ever arrested for that thing? Or was it just too big of a mob? No, that, nobody. Because nobody, it was just too many people. So too no many really people. Yeah. And no, nobody. Yeah. Well, know. I mean, rest in peace to the guy who passed and right. his family. I'm sure it was a fucked up situation. I, I never heard about this before. Well, the final thing I want to say about Suge in his podcast was he said that after Tupac's murder, Snoop and Daz did a song on Big Dre's compilation album. Big Dre was one of the guys in the car. Right. And he felt that that was, you know, a big violation because here's one of the guys who was involved in the murder of Tupac and Snoop and Daz supposed to be cool with Tupac and they're doing music with this guy. That's what he said. I don't Why know if there's any truth. Why the fuck would he say that? He said free keep it deep. What's the difference? <laughs> What's the difference? Yeah, man, listen. Suge is an expert at creating chaos. Yeah. There is no one better than, than, than Suge Knight in throwing some stuff out there. Going back to the whole Easy e you know, AIDS needle injection thing. Because, you know, that rumor had been going for so long and i remember there was a tv show that they kind of you know looked into all that and i remember like i didn't even know because I, I know crooked eye right right me and him are cool and crooked eye was actually with suge during the taping i think it was like jimmy kimmel or something mm -hmm. and when suge said that on the way home they were in the car together and he was and he was like yo suge you know you you know someone something about easy getting injected with AIDS? He's like, no, but I'd be hearing people be doing shit like that. So he basically admitted that he just made up the whole the whole situation. But people have been running with this whole conspiracy this whole time. You know, those guys were having sex with different individuals. Who a easy? lot of them, other, yeah, they was having. Yeah, no, cool easy. You can see by the number shit. of kids he right. has, and he even I remember he was on Howard Stern. Easy said he never uses condoms, and you could tell by the number of kids he had. Like he has two sons named Eric from different women. He had like two or three women pregnant when he died, some of which he probably didn't even know about. Damn. Like, yeah, Easy e Let me see, how many kids does Easy e have? I bet he ain't got more than my little brother. 11 kids. My brother got him by eight. Your little brother has 19 kids. That I count. Hey, Timmy was having them knock on the door. They was knocking on the door. Uh, my name is Woo Woo. My dad, can I see my dad? Timmy got a lot of kids. Yeah, I don't think Timmy could pull out of his own driveway, man. <laughs> his pull-out game is pretty weak, man. To have that man, many kids. <laughs> it, it ain't happening. <laughs> he got all the grandkids, all this shit. Crazy. Well, just recently, I was out of Miami, and I went to Vanilla Ice's house. Oh, my God. And I interviewed him. So we talked about this whole situation. Now, leading up to the hotel incident, Suge had actually 
approached Vanilla Ice at a restaurant twice. One time at the Palm restaurant and another time at Benihana. Mm-hmm. Were you with Suge either of those times? Yeah, one of them. Okay. What he said was, I think it was at the Benihana one, Suge basically showed up at the restaurant, sat down, and started eating Vanilla Ice's food in front of him. Well, Suge pops up at you at a restaurant. Yeah. And he was friendly. Yeah. Then he pops up on you again at uh, Benihana. Yeah. Yeah. Once again, relatively friendly. He starts eating some of my food, too. He starts eating your food? Yeah, he asked. (laughs) He's nice. He's always smiling and friendly. You have to understand, like, this this picture that Vic Walters painted about him is a complete different picture of what most of the people's public perception is about Suge Knight. He had a good personality. He was funny. We got along. Suge and I really never had a, a, a problem, a disagreement, or anything like that. Never heard that. Yeah. See, Suge, Suge like bragging, right? Suge would have said that shit. Um... Well, Vanilla Ice said that. Oh, Vanilla Ice Vanilla said that. Vanilla Ice said that. I don't know. Vanilla I Ice said that. I said believe that. it if it came from Shook, but it, Vanilla Ice said it happened to you. The only thing I know about that is that Shook had a contract made up, and he said Chocolate is the one that did a certain song for him. Okay, so 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 let, let's talk about the story for a second. So, like I said, there's a new Vanilla Ice interview out right now talking about all this. Vanilla Ice blew up off the song Ice Ice Baby. Mm-hmm. It was the first rap song to go number one on Billboard. It sold like half a billion copies over time, right? It made so much money that when he got sued by David Bowie and Queen for sampling Under Pressure, he mm. bought Under Pressure. <laughs> he just bought the whole song. So now he owns Ice Ice Baby and Under Pressure. Damn. Yeah. Vanilla Ice is wealthy, by the way. He owns like 100 properties. Yeah, I know. Like, like we showed up at his house in Miami and like we pulled up to the house. We're waiting for him. We're waiting for him. And he comes in from the house next door. It was like, no, coming over here. We pull into this other house and that house we were at was connected to the first house. Damn. And then there's another house afterwards that had a helicopter pad and some other shit. I know he got money. No, he got serious money. Right. I didn't realize how much money he had. He's he's wealthy. He's not. He's rich. a contractor or some other. Oh yeah, that, yeah. He he builds homes right. and pools and he did right with his money. He did right with his money. So, according to him, he wrote "Ice Ice Baby" when he was uh, 16 years old, and then you know when they started putting the album together, they produced it, they put it out, whatever else. Now this guy Chocolate claims that he did the song. He right. wrote like eight songs on the album, and he never got his credit. Won't he? Won't. So he hooks up with Suge at one point, and Suge starts managing him, whatever that means. And basically, according to their side, was that, you know, Chocolate, you know, r- produced and wrote all, all these, you know, all these important songs, including Ice Ice Baby. So Suge took it upon himself to try to get the money for that. Right. Did you know Chocolate at all? Yeah. You were around him. We we had Fern Hill Records at that time. Chocolate used to come to the office, 5555 Wilshire Boulevard. Okay. And he came up there. I remember when Suge had the contract done. But this is Suge's whole gig. Suge would would deal with Chocolate and Chocolate and and Chocolate got mad at me because I mentioned this before. And he said I was wrong. So I'm going to say it this way. Whatever Dylan Suge had with chocolate, like other people, Suge would go and talk to those people. What Suge did with Vanilla Ice is what he do with Dr. Dre and other people that he has got money for. So he went to Vanilla Ice to say, I don't give a fuck. Chocolate said, whoop, whoop, whoop. Sign this goddamn contract. You're going to give him his credit where credit is due, yada, yada. And Vanilla Ice signed the shit at the end of the day. That's all I know of. Okay, so here's Vanilla Ice's version of the story. He said that Chocolate had nothing to do with this with this song, right? I that. He's eating in L.A. Suge shows up at his restaurant one time, sits down with him, introduces himself. So he's very polite, very nice. 
a month later, Suge shows up again. I used to wonder, how, how does this guy know where I am? Right. Sits down with him again. I think it was a Benny Hanna second time. Started eating his food, like I said. Once again, he's thinking, how does this guy know where I am? And then him and his two body, Vanilla Ice and his two bodyguards are coming back to his hotel room. When they get in the room, Suge and five other guys are already in the room. And he's just wondering, how the hell did this guy know where I am? And how did he get into the room? Right. So, he said it was five guys. There was a rumor that one of them was the LA Rams or whatever else. Do you know who, but by the way, do you know who was in that room, in that hotel room with Vanilla Ice? Uh, I've heard two names thrown around. I don't know if it's true or not. Daryl Henley and Ron Brown. Ron Brown was hanging with Suge Tough. Okay. Daryl Henley, ain't that the dude that went to jail for the drugs? I think so. Possibly. I don't. All the guys that hung with Ron, Ron Brown at that time. Daryl Henley's a guy from the Rams. Okay, there we go. Okay, Ron Brown too. Oh, Ron Brown's from the, from the Rams also. Yeah, okay. he fucked he fuck with the Rams too. And a lot of those guys Suge was dealing with. You know what I'm saying? And, okay. and, until they turned on each other. But they was hanging around at that time. So all I know is I wasn't there. You weren't there. Okay. So this is a story that Vanilla Ice said. He said these guys were in the room with him. He had his two bodyguards who were armed. <laughs> he said that Suge slapped one of his bodyguards and took his gun. Well, then at one <laughs> point, you come back to your hotel room with your two bodyguards, you open the door, and Suge is there in your room yeah. with like five guys. Yeah. What happens next? Uh, I saw that they uh, all had guns right away. And that uh, they're not to be fucked with, but they're very well dressed and smelled good. And they were all <laughs> smiling and saying they're huge fans. And they wanted to take pictures for their daughters and their family. And I did. And everything was cool. Until uh, Suge said he'd like to talk to me uh, on the balcony yes. uh, alone. And I said, oh, okay, it's fine with me. My bodyguard stood up and he got slapped down. <laughs> he, he slapped the bodyguards. Oh, yeah. Himself or one of his guys? I, I hate to tell you, he slapped him so hard and made him cry. My bodyguard. Oh, wow. Yeah. Took his gun out of his, he took his gun from him too. Suge took your bodyguard's no, gun. Suge didn't. Oh, one of his guys did. No. His guys, if you want to call them that, I think they were there for backup. That's bullshit. That's the story he told. No, I'm telling you that's bullshit because that would have came back. At that time, uh, uh, Fernhill Records was fresh. Suge was still out there being a bully, true enough. But... It wasn't. It wasn't none of us that that I wasn't there for. For no, nah, she would have came back with that one. She would have came back and and said I took the gun. She would have no. Okay, I don't believe it. So when I asked if chocolate was there, Vanilla Ice said he wasn't there initially, but thirty minutes later, chocolate did show up. And his face was all fucked up. He said he had a big fat lip and a big bruise on his eye, like a black eye, like they had just beat him up. Chocolate getting beat up. Does this sound like something that would happen or does this sound? Chocolate never got beat up on my watch. Um, and was people known to get their ass whooped when it was Fernhill Records? Yes. Okay. If they weren't saying the right shit, they got their ass whooped. But Chocolate came there, he was cool. He was young too, so he wouldn't know type of cat. So no, I didn't, I, I wouldn't have saw that. This is Ice's story, I mean, listen, Chocolate ended up doing an interview where he basically talked a bunch of shit about Vanilla Ice, which I'm sure he saw, so I, I'm, I'm sure there's a certain level of animosity between these two. Right. But ultimately, Suge, according to Ice, Took Ice to the balcony. He didn't hold him out, out the window or anything else like that. Like four heart, you know, the five heartbeats or things right. like that. And the change wasn't falling out of his pocket or whatever. Right. But he took him to the to the balcony and basically said, look, uh, I run this city. Uh, you know, Dr. Dre, uh, Arsenio Hall, Eddie Murphy, they're all under me. So if you want to have protection, then you need to sign all this paperwork. 
and ICE being scared signed the paperwork. I believe that. I interviewed Virgil Roberts, who was the president of Solar Records. He became the president. I'm not sure if he was the president or the vice president or whatever. I'm not sure if Dick Griffey, Dick Griffey was alive, but at one point he became president. Mm -hmm. And he talked about that whole situation. He said, he said it was actually a little bit exaggerated. Um, he said that when Suge approached him with this guy Chocolate and said, look, you know, this producer that I'm managing produced Ice Ice Baby and these other records. And Virgil's like, well, can you prove it? And he goes, well, I have my handwritten notes. He goes, well, this is cool, but this doesn't really prove anything. Right. And he goes, well, I also have my credit on the original album that Vanilla Ice put out. Because before he got signed to his major label, they put it out independently, and his name was on the credits. So at that point, Virgil Roberts felt like there was enough to go off of. They sued uh, the record label that Ice was signed to, and then ultimately they paid up. Well, he didn't get that goddamn much. Is he getting paid for a lifetime? I don't know. I mean, according to Ice, he is getting paid forever. I mean, according to Virgil, it's like 400000 You know, he gave the money. You know, Suge got the biggest check he's ever gotten at the time. You know, Chocolate I, I got a You know, Because when, when, when Suge got that, that deal in all squared away, Chocolate went and bought a Mercedes. He was exactly, coming, yeah. He was coming up with a Mercedes. Exactly. And uh, I was like, okay, he got paid. But Suge was doing that for a lot of people. Who else? DLC? He was he was with DLC. He did Dre and Michelet. He went to TLC. Uh all oh, right, he was. I yeah. believe Mary J. Blige. Yeah. A lot of people uh, was, Yeah, a lot of people was coming to Suge to get their shit fixed mm -hmm. and to get what they what they felt was due to him. Right. So Suge did a lot of uh Getting people their money, should right. I say? Yeah, it didn't always work out. I, I remember when I, when Vlad TV was in Universal, I remember going into one of the security rooms, and there was a picture of Suge, and it said "Do not allow in the building," because I guess he had threatened the president of Universal Records, and you know, there's an armed security in front that would take the president in and out of right. his car, and you know, Suge being Suge, basically. So yeah, it was uh, it was a crazy time. Now speaking of the L.A. Rams, wasn't there a fight with the L.A. Rams that you got into it in '92? Yeah. yeah. What happened? Suge, Suge, uh, everybody in the in the in the club. I think it was Roxbury or some shit like that. Everybody in the club partying. Everybody drinking. Suge goes outside. He runs into the Rams. One of the Ram guys was fucking with a female that Suge was fucking with. The Ram dude goes over to Suge's uh, car and stretch the motherfucker, stretch, stretch the motherfucker up. So Suge come to us, get us, we all come outside. It's like six, seven big, big old motherfuckers outside, right? So now Suge choose to go off at the mouth, talking shit. And I think your cousin, one of the twins, took off, and everybody else took off. And we got to wear their ass out. L.A. Rams. Yeah. We, we started beating the shit out of them. Okay. And uh, the only way the fight was over, the police pulled up, and your cousin was still beating the shit out of the motherfucker, had him up under the car. His head from this part right here was up under the front of the car and he's still beating the shit out of him and he the only one went to jail. Mm. But by the time we got to the, the office, he was on his way to the office. Mm. Just the other day at the office at death row, huh? Which Suge should have started fighting this motherfucker when he starts uh, fucking his car up. No, Suge didn't do that. Suge came and got all of us mm. and then went off at the mall. Well, uh, Puffy got sued by Cassie recently. Mm -hmm. Settled within 24 hours. He already knew. He already knew. But in this lawsuit, a whole lot of stuff came up. And there was this one part 
in the Cassie lawsuit where they're saying that Puffy attempted to ambush Suge Knight in Los Angeles. Like he found out Suge was at a certain location, so Puffy went and got all his guns and everything else like that. Um, I don't know if it's true or not, because you know how lawsuits go, but was it really that crazy at that point? When when it started, yeah, it was crazy. Uh, all the fighting, all the shit going back and forth, you know, losing Big Jake. Um, that happened in Atlanta. Huh? Yeah. yeah. And that was allegedly done by Wolf. Who's right. All, who's also dead He's now. He's dead now. Yeah. So And Wolf was sort of the head of uh, Puffy Security. Right. And yet all of it started, you know, because Puffy decided not to give in to Shug no more. You know what I'm saying? And he, it, when he started staying away from Suge and he couldn't, Suge couldn't get to him the way he wanted to, it was on. But where we fucked up is we came in because of what Suge was saying and how motherfuckers is treating him. We didn't know exactly, oh, Suge just mad at this motherfucker because he can't get to him or get nothing out of him. And now this war is on and everybody just decided to Say, fuck it, nigga, we rolling with you. Yeah, I mean, imagine if, because it didn't seem like Puffy was necessarily the aggressor in this situation. Puffy, no. you know, Puffy, I'm sure, you know, I mean, listen, Biggie did some sideways shit too, because when, when the Dog Pound was taping New York, New York in Brooklyn, Biggie got on the radio and basically said some shit that ultimately triggered a shooting that happened. You got to look at it. It's, this shit ain't one-sided just because we from L.A. Are they not to respond to, to what the shit we giving them? Yeah. Yeah, they supposed to. Right. So when they do respond, Suge is fucking mad that that all these motherfuckers think they the shit. Oh, they, they fighting back? Come on, man. It don't go that way. Imagine if at some point somebody sat both of them down and said, all of y'all are tripping right now. Y'all got the hottest artists in the world. Imagine a tour, a Tupac Biggie tour. <laughs> Imagine a Tupac and Biggie, a death row bad boy tour. The, the end of the East Coast, West Coast war tour all around the world. Fuck America, Europe, Africa, Asia. The, the Middle East, Australia. Like, if they just said, fuck this whole thing. Look, we're all making hundreds of millions of dollars. It's impossible. You know, for it to look, everyone knows that Puffy did not set up Tupac. Right. Right, or Biggie did not set up Tupac to get shot. Right? Pac was getting into it with the Haitian Jacks and the Jimmy Henchmans, and you could connect the dots from that. Yeah. Okay? It's not a secret as to it wasn't Biggie trying to get him killed. Everyone knows that really Pac and Biggie started out as friends. Right. Pac used to go to Brooklyn and hang out with Biggie. You know what I'm saying? Like, in fact, when I interviewed Lanson Rivera, he even said that after Pac got shot, he went up into the studio where they were at and left his gun like behind the piano. And then... The police came. They couldn't find the gun. And Pac called them up, called Biggie up, and Biggie sent his guys to go down there and get his gun back for him. Mm. He ends up getting jammed up in the hallway from whatever story was told by everybody who was there, mm -hmm. right? Whoever was there told the story. He ends up getting shot. He goes upstairs. He, he has his gun that he came to the studio with. He hides it in a piano. Mm -hmm. And then what everybody do, don't know is that Pac called Big after that incident, right? And said, Big, I left my gun in the studio. Send somebody to get it. Mm -hmm. So I sent somebody, two people up to the studio. One of them is the only person who had access because it was taped off being investigated. He was the only one who could get past that yellow tape. We retrieved Tupac's gun and made sure that, because if Tupac had it got caught with that gun, because 
Think about it. He did everybody's story is Tupac pulled his gun out. He shot himself. All right. But no, big, his man. <laughs> he called his man and said, yo, big. You know, but everybody want to make it seem like Tupac set big up in the studio. Meaning that there was no animosity after the shooting. They were still cool, essentially. Right. Saying that, imagine if someone, you know, like a Clarence uh, uh, Avant, you right. know, or someone of that stature or a Quincy Jones came in and said, enough. This is stupid. We're all losing money. You know, right. like for example, okay, I'll, I'll tell you what. Me and Wack hadn't talked to each other in 10 years, mm -hmm. right? And I, I tried to get an interview going with Game. Wack was aware of it, but he since he knew that we had some conflict from 10 years ago, he said, I'm going to stay out of it and let y'all handle it. It ended up falling apart, right? right. Game was going to show up three hours late, and the, the money situation wasn't worked out. So me, me and Wack, we got on the phone, and my first words to Wack was, listen, you and I had a disagreement 10 years ago. Right. I was wrong and you were wrong. Right. Instead of us arguing for the next 30 minutes about who did what, let's just say, fuck it. Grown men. We're shit. here to do some business. You have an a, a artist that you're managing that I want to interview. I'm willing to cut a check that everyone's agreeing to. You're going to get a piece of this. Your artist is going to get some money in his pocket. Right. Fuck, fuck what happened. 10 years ago. It's stupid. Because whatever happened 10 years ago hasn't affected me and it hasn't affected you. Right. We've all made lots of money since then. You know what Wax said? Sounds good to me. Let's, let's schedule it. And you know what happened? Game came in, did the interview. Wack was there. There's a picture of all three of us together. It worked. It worked. That's right. Game, you know what I mean? Got what he wanted. I got what I wanted. The interview's out now. It's doing great. And Wack is supposed to come in and do another interview with me for our first interview together. That's cool. That's cool. We're grown men. You know, just like with Park Nim, you know, Suge had to get over his ego. That's that's what play a big part with all of this, this bullshit that be going on with different cliques and all this other shit. And and Suge's biggest problem was being said no to. And he felt like he was this high above everything and he it, with his body size and all that intimidation went a long way and then when people started getting it 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 didn't work no more but half of us that has these goddamn problems these dudes shouldn't even be they got money ain't no sense of fighting and killing each other you got money and and that's one of our downfalls as as black men as men period in this business Cause it's interesting, because we did an interview recently with DOC, mm -hmm. right? Uh, my man Justin Hunt did the actual interview. But me, me and DOC are friends, man. We we go back. I have a lot of respect for that dude. And in the interview, Justin asked Doc, he said, you were involved in the making of Straight Outta Compton as well as The Chronic. Mm -hmm. What was the difference between these two projects? He had an interesting answer. He said, when it came to Straight Outta Compton, there were guys that were, you know, affiliated with the streets, you know, may have been drug dealers, may have had gang affiliations, whatever, but everyone there was really focusing on being musicians right. and being artists and were happy to be part of this creative process right. and we're all trying to contribute somehow musically right. to this project because everyone understood how big and important it was and how the bullshit they were doing before really yeah i mean it had a part in terms of the content but there was no like gangster shit happening or right. whatever else now when you then look at what happened at death row he said the majority of the people maybe not a majority but a lot of the people that were in the studio were guys that either had just come out of prison or were on their way to prison. Right. They had nothing to do with music. They couldn't rap. They couldn't produce. They couldn't sing. They couldn't manage. They couldn't A&R. They were just there basically because of Suge's intimidation. Right. 
And you didn't know what day when one of them would just start to fuck with you, start to make, and, he's, and, and Doc said it was stressful, man. All of you guys came together and made arguably the greatest rap album of all time. To me, that shows a sign of being able to harness different types of energies, whether positive or negative, to create something beautiful for the world. What was the temperature tone during the chronic sessions like? There's no difference between the sessions in the NWA days and the chronic days. When it comes to the music being made, the only difference is that the element that's surrounding us while we're making music changed. It intensified on that, what you want to call gangster level, where it started being just a whole bunch of, uh, street corner kind of people that were really about that life instead of being about the music life, hanging out, you know. Um, with NWA, it was still street guys um, hanging out. Some guys were street corner guys, but most of us were just musicians, and most of those people were just happy to be around great music. Um, so by the time it got to death row, the only difference was these are guys that were either going either on their way to the penitentiary or just coming home from the penitentiary. And this was like the amusement park for them, you know, for the rest of us, or at least for me, it was hell, you know, going in there and dealing with these folks on a day-to-day -day basis because I never knew which day could be my day that some terrible shit happens to you and, you know, but like I said, Sugar was overly protective and folks knew, don't mess with that one, you know, leave that one alone. You know? And so I always felt uh, grateful to Sugar for, for that, being able to exist in that space and not be, uh, you know, so worried that something was gonna happen because it was still guys that was hanging around with that bully mentality that wanna poke you and push push your buttons because they know they can do it. They know you're not going to do nothing kind of stuff. Doc is not a little guy, by the way. Doc is like 6'3". I know him. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. This is not some little scrawny little dude. It's like he's a big guy and he was just like every day, he said he was just stressful for him. He was in there trying to, because Doc is the creative guy. He's writing the verses. He's helping Snoop. He's whatever. And he's just like, man, I just, he just, he's like, I hated that environment. And all of them, all of them should have felt that way. You know, coming up there and and you got all these big old guys and now they arguing with their girl and the next thing you know, they mad. We're going to take it out on these motherfuckers. So that, that's what would happen. And you can't work like that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That was one of my reasons not to be in their way. And Suge was told this many times. You're, you're letting your ego get in the way. You're letting this bullshit get in the way. He done went from a green suit to a red suit. He done went from cigars to popping pills. He done went to drinking. So Suge let his woo -woo gangster shit get in the way. And a lot of people, ain't no way in the world you're going to continue to make money with each other and you want all the money. You don't want nobody to stand in front of you. You, you want to be up front. You want to be the one that got the money. You want you the one that wanted to be seen. I used to tell the homies, look at us. We pulling up in 77 Cadillacs and 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 Caprice Classics, Cadillacs and shit. Suge pulling up in motherfucking Porsches and this and that. When the people see Suge, see us, the only person they see is Suge. When we walk after Suge walk through a door, everybody else do this because. They scared of us. Yeah. Shook dressed well, got his red suit on, his cigar, and all this other shit. We coming in looking like this shit. I remember during that time, Shook had diamonds in his ear that just didn't make any damn sense. Exactly. It he, was so, he had like, like three or like four carat diamonds in his ear that was just insane. He had to be like that. Even with the women, he had to be seen. He had, you couldn't, I couldn't be sitting there talking to a fine ass woman without Shug coming over there. I'm the one with the money, I'm the boss. Woo, woo, woo. Man, get the fuck. 
Well, I mean, just the fact that Suge would have a baby with Michelle A, who also had a baby with Dre. He out of line. Is, is just insane. Like, I'm looking like in terms of me, I have never in life had any relations with a girl that used to date one of my friends. Right. I just felt it was stupid. There's a lot of them out there like that, though, that wouldn't give a fuck, take your leftovers and and, and marry them, like Suge did. I, I'm just saying, though, like, but not only is this a girl of someone you're associated with, this is the superstar on your label. Yeah. This is the person who's making all this happen. But I, I guess from what I heard from Suge's point of view was that Dre leaving, he kind of didn't, wasn't tripping because Tupac was already there. He felt like Tupac was going to, you know, fill in whatever void Dre had, but which may have happened if, if Pac had lived, but you can't deny the musical genius that's Dr. Dre. Period. You can't deny it. Just look at the track record. Right. And ultimately, when Pac died, that was it for Death Row. So you got to understand, Suge didn't care about none of that. Suge had to be seen. He had to be the man. And, you know, if Suge would have just kept his shit straight business and 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 transformed us from, you know, the gang attire to, to, to wearing, you know, the button downs and the linen suits and shit, the homies would have been cool with that. Suge had to be, we had to be aggressive. Everywhere and everything we did, we had to be aggress aggressive. Now, what happened was all the shit he was doing, now he working the homie over here, talking to the homie over here. And he telling him, oh, that nigga called and said you was a bitch. Oh, that nigga said you didn't do this and you went in the hood long. Why the fuck is you doing that type of shit? So he started working us against each other. Yeah. For us to fall apart, and then this was his way of trying to get rid of this persona, the gang shit. So if we start fighting and killing each other, but what he failed to realize, everything was coming back to him. So when the homies started coming to him, they did exactly what I did, accepted the fucking check, opposed to getting that sugar and dealing with him like I said we should do. So everybody accepted the check. So he's free to do whatever. Like when he bring, brung Reggie them to the, to the scene. That was only because he thought if the police there, the homies been to prison and all this, they're going to be like, oh, shit, they got the police here. I'm pissed off. Why the fuck is they here? This don't mix. You know, like, for example, we had uh, Nicholas Irving on our show recently. Nicholas Irving was... Uh, his nickname was the Reaper. He was an army sniper mm -hmm. that had killed 33 people in the line of duty. Mm -hmm. So he's, he's serious. And we asked him about what he felt about homeboy security. Cause we talked about the whole takeoff situation, mm -hmm. right? Cause in my eyes, which he agreed, takeoff died because he had homeboy security. He had well, you know, Quavo had his guy there, he had dreadlocks, pulled out a gun when the argument started to kind of ensue over the dice game, right? which I'm sure escalated everything. Next thing you know, a shootout happens and Takeoff, who's not even involved in the argument, ends up dead. Right. I, I think I can get the mentality of, you know, I, this is my guy, I, I've known him my whole life, he's always had my back, he would never let nothing happen to me, but that could also be a hindrance, that could also be a, a huge liability because he's willing to do that or because you know he, he, he's able to do that or capable of doing that. That also can lead to when now you're put into a position that you may not want to be in or because he's not trained and he's not as good as you think he is just because he could pull a trigger on a, on a, on a, on a Glock 23 every once in a while in, in the backyard doesn't mean anything. You know, it, it's the last thing any security ever wants to do, a bodyguard, is to pull their weapon put their hands on someone. Most of the time, 99.9% .9 of the time, your job is to de-escalate, de-escalate, de-escalate. Never to even be in a position to where that can even happen. And if it does happen, if it does happen, you know, um, there's ways of making sure that that problem gets taken care of quickly, immediately, and no harm 
to anyone else's, uh, you know, is done. Probably wouldn't have not done the dice game to begin with. Um, I don't know, I'm a different type of security. I get everybody wants to have fun, but what is 30 minutes of pleasure for eternity of, yeah, dead, you know? I'd rather just have my client mad at me because I'm like, dude, we're getting out of here. I'd rather you be mad at me for that than having to wake up the next day or make a call right after you get shot in, the, in wherever and telling the cops, hey, just got a, you know, an incident that happened and the person who employed me, I had no longer have a job because, you know, that happened. When I knew that all I had to do was just avoid that whole situation. Hey, let, let's just back out of this for a little bit. Things don't, a real security guard person knows how to read people, read in an environment, knows the, it, you're never, I mean, you're looking at your client, but most of the time we're looking at everyone else. We're looking at your intention. What is, what, what, what is in your eyes? What's in your, what, what the, uh, what body language do you put off? And yeah, hot situations, there's just no point of hanging around it. Nothing wrong with, you're not walking away as a client, it's me. You're still a tough guy. I'm the one who ran you out of there, not you. So I don't know. I'd rather have it looked at it like that as opposed to, you know, picking up someone's brains. And I think that this is ultimately, this is the perfect example of, you should just, if you want security, there's so many options for professional security from Navy SEALs to, to whatever the fuck else. If you, and you have the money. I remember 50 Cent used to roll around with Navy SEALs a lot. Suge would have never got what he wanted out of certain people with that type of security. Right, because they're not going to intimidate anybody. No. Not, they, that's not they, my job. They mind and they've been as long as you don't touch Suge Knight. Yeah. Suge Knight had... I see what you're saying. People working for him that was ready to fight, that was ready to do certain things. Some cats was getting bonus, a bonus if they knocked out a motherfucker that night. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, Suge was feeding his pups. They was getting they, 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 they little shit just for being who they were. And the homies was comfortable with living that life and getting paid for it. Yeah, I remember we did an interview with this guy named Tere. He was uh, a reporter. Mm -hmm. And uh, we actually turned a cartoon into this story, right? And, and the story basically was this, was... He showed up to death row to do an interview. Mm -hmm. And Suge is giving him the interview and he's talking all this kind of stuff and blah, 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 blah. And at one point he said, now what about the, the lawsuit with Dick Griffey and Solar Records? Mm -hmm. And he was like, what, what did you just say? He went and got one of his homies and he said like this dude was just like ripped up and just, uh, and Chug was like, yeah, this motherfucker talking about lawsuits. The guy was like, what? And he was like, basically like, the way he described it, Chug was basically almost had a, had a fucking, you know, was holding him back from like killing this dude. Right. Was just like, yo man, what do you want me to do with him? No, nah, you know, and this guy was like basically ready to tear him apart. Right? And, uh, Suge kind of basically had this whole show of force. <clears throat> and then he took his recorder, deleted everything on the recorder, and had him redo the interview and answer the questions the exact same way, <laughs> but just without the lawsuit question. Wow. <laughs> but but this is how he would basically use these people who you are affiliated with right. to just scare people. Right. But th the thing is, though, you can't scare everybody. Certain people are like, like, Jimmy Iovine wasn't scared. Well, I know at the beginning Puppy was mm -hmm. until Puppy knew he had to distance himself from Suge. Akon, when Suge, when certain individuals, the homies was not with Suge no more, motherfuckers weren't that intimidated by Suge no more. Right. He had actually mentioned my Akon interview in the podcast. He even mm -hmm. cut to it. And he basically said that Akon had messed with some underage girl, I think basically as like a revenge of, you know, which I don't think is true. I just don't think it's true. But I think it was kind of like, uh, well, fuck you too. I'm going to say some shit about you if right. you don't say shit about me. Right. It's kind of wild, man, seeing Suge be Suge in prison. Because it's like when, when the podcast is over, he's going back to his cell. It's not like he's out here. And that's like, what he got to realize. That's all it is. Now, is that something 
to do. I bet you when he went back to that cell, he thought about the shit he said. Damn, I shouldn't have said that. Yeah, I don't know. Shit. I, I, I don't know. But Shug has consistently been Shug. I, I've never seen like an evolved Shug Knight all these years. You know, at some point, like, you know, for example, like, like Game. When I interviewed him, he got into it with some dude on the basketball court and ended up punching him. Yeah, I saw that. Video. You know, and uh, he had to basically, to avoid jail time, because he went to jail before for some shit like this, but to avoid jail time, he had to take anger management classes. Right. And he said, he would mention the, the, you know, the woman's name. He goes, you know, honestly, he's like, I learned a lot. I learned a lot about how I manage my anger and how I deal with people. And, and now I don't, I'm not as angry and you know and I, you know listen and dealing with game it's like and i've known game for like 20 years at this point i'm like i, I can kind of see it I, I i see what you're talking about you don't seem like the same angry aggressive game that i've known before he getting older he growing up and and you know you got to deal with the consequences yeah so i i'm you know he get it mm -hmm. some of us don't 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 make it to that point to where we get it we just stay Reckless. So he get it. Yeah, but one person's in jail and the other person is out driving around in Rolls Royces. You know what I'm saying? And they all come from the same place. Exactly. And that's what we don't get. And, and in fact, you could say Suge made a lot more money than Game over the years. Yeah. You know, because he was the label owner. You know what I'm saying? Game has done well for himself, but Suge did really well. Well, instead of being a a boss, he wanted to be something that he always wanted to be. He wanted to be those guys that's walking past his house and he can't go get off the porch with. Hmm. Well, Shook said that uh, he took a gun charge for Dre at one point. I don't know. I Anything about that? Yeah. I don't know. I've never heard that before. Shook be talking shit, man. <laughs> I'm telling you. Well... The Gangster Chronicles. Mm -hmm. When I first heard about the Gangster Chronicles, it was you, Reggie, and uh, Alex it? Alonzo. Alex Alonzo, right. But now, the current lineup of the Gangster Chronicles is Norm Steele, MC8, and I guess Soren Baker. Or I didn't even know Soren was in it. Well, he's in the last two episodes. It seems like he's part of the show. Oh, I didn't know. What what more part with John? I, I know Soren. I, I guess seeing a, a middle class white kid be part of the lineup of Gangster Chronicles is somewhat amusing. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like I, I I wouldn't put myself in the Gangster Chronicles. I've been right. a guest on the show, right. but I wouldn't be part of the actual permanent cast. Right. You know what I'm saying? This is not a shot of Soren. I just find it a little bit amusing because obviously he's not a gangster. Right. You know what I mean? Um, so what exactly happened from, you know, you're not part of it, Reggie's not part of it. Was Norm part of it from the very beginning? Well, he the one that, that contacted Reggie and Reggie contacted me. Greed. Um, Norm wanted, instead of splitting, it, splitting that check half and half, you know, because me and him signed a contract 50-50, and uh, on Gangster Chronicles, Gangster Chronicles only. But the the backdoor shit that he was doing, I had no clue of. I had no clue, no business. I wasn't business minded on none of that shit. And and I didn't pay attention to nothing. As long as they took care of shit, I was cool. So Norm got to a point where, okay, splitting this this money, it ain't making him look good, I guess. So he come and say. Well, this goddamn uh, allegations, this this rat shit, man, is fucking with our business. Oh, what allegations fuck? against you? Yeah. What the fuck you mean? What are you talking about? So me, I didn't give a fuck what he was talking about. So me and him just gradually stopped talking. And when it was time after the last season, let me get my money. And I asked him, when we going to start the next the next season? Oh, we going to woo-woo. Me and him haven't had a word since February of last year. Ain't of said one year. word. Yeah. Okay, because MC8 was on the show when you were on the show. Yeah. There was the overlap. Yeah. And I think MC8's a good addition to that show. That, yeah, he was. Yeah, absolutely. 
you know, OG, you know, in this rap shit, as well as, you know, history background. I, I like MC8. Um, Norm Steele got on the mic at one point. Yeah. And stayed there. Yeah. And then, like I said, Soren Baker seems to be the third person. And you said that you're not making any money off this. No. Okay. It's a little weird considering that, you know, for example, I took a certain level of pride as to, you know, something I was the first person to put Mob James on this YouTube platform right. and it took off to the point that it actually triggered him starting his own podcast right. and so forth. I've never asked for anything, by the way, when it comes right. to you, you're right. Not not one penny. In fact, I even came on the show when you guys asked. That to was support. big for me too, yeah. So so I'm I'm just letting everyone know what my point of view is. Right. To me, it's a little weird that the person that I helped start in this podcast game who was part of this successful podcast is no longer part of this successful right. podcast anymore. Right. Well, just like you were saying, our game, his growth. I could have went to the streets with the shit. I could have did a lot of things. But what do they get me? I'm not going to get no money. I'm in jail. I lose my grandson, everything. So I chose to walk away and, and, and let people see. I didn't give a fuck about that. Gangster Chronicles didn't change me. So if I ever see a Norm Steele, then we might have a problem. We might have a problem. It depends on how I feel. But other than that, I'm not going to let that situation interfere with where I'm at, what I'm doing. I'm still, I'm still hanging in there. It's, you know, I'm not, I'm not tripping off dorm. I don't give a fuck. Y'all, if y'all make it, y'all make it. But Gangster, Gangster Chronicles didn't define me as who I am. It helped me, but like I said, in keeping 100, Vlad helped me understand who Mob James was and and was the first person to, to allow me to vent. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Not Gangster Chronicles. Yeah. So, but Gangster Chronicles was, it helped me grow also. You know what I'm saying? Well, it was your project. Like, I was happy for you. I'm like, okay, cool. Right. Like, I'm still fucking with, with, with James, and he's still welcome on my platform. Right. But this is his own shit, his own money, doing his own thing. Right. And then, you know, Charlemagne picked y'all up for the for the black effect. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure there is some- That bullshit. And, and I don't want to speak bad on that brother, but he know I got a 50-50 with, with Norm. You know what I'm saying? So I'm trying to, I'm doing the lawyer shit, trying to see what's happening, what, where I'm at. I hear the show ain't doing what it used to and how it was, but I don't give a fuck about none of that. Let's get a lawyer, do this shit legit, and then now people can see me in a different light for sure. Because I know where he recording at. I can go there. But if something happened to him, where they going? Straight to me. Yeah. So it's been damn near a year and I, I ain't called his phone, I ain't said shit to him. The scary motherfucker won't even call and say, man, check this out. This is whoop de whoop whoop. So it's like fuck Gangster Chronicles, fuck Norm, and 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 it is what it is. Well, I hope at one point it does, you know, get worked out because I don't think that the show has the same magic right. as when you were on. And right. I'll just be honest, because I, I listen to a lot of those episodes, you know. Well, he's a guy that won't, like I, we were saying earlier, he won all the credit. And he felt, okay, once we got this going, now he think he can just go on and roll with it from this point. And then now he can dish and do the money how he choose to. It's yeah, but it's, to it doesn't seem like it's that much money. Like It's I, I, not. Like, like I'm looking at the YouTube views going like, okay, the YouTube is essentially zero. Right. I'm looking at the, like, I don't know what the deal is on the podcast side, but on the YouTube side, it's not even hitting like a thousand views sometimes. Right. So that's essentially zero. Right. So if there's money on the podcast side, I don't know, but a lot of times people don't want to admit that things worked because of the combination and the partnership right. of certain people. Right. 
like Dame Dash could talk all the shit he wants these days and say that he originated this and he was the main force behind that or whatever else. But you look at where he is right now, where Jay-Z is right now, you could see where the real talent was in that group. Right, exactly. You know what I'm saying? Unfortunately, you know, Dame is taking his shots at me. I don't care, but... You know, we all we all looked up to Dame at one point, you know, seeing the whole Rockefeller, how, how big it got. But when you look, Dame hasn't dropped anything significant in the last, like, 15 years, essentially. Right. Whereas Jay, boom. You know, God Rock Nation. Billion, yeah. You know, goddamn, uh, you know, huge liquor deals, you know, um, huge artists like like you know beyonce's massive concerts like that this is all that jay has his hands right, right you know what i'm saying i'm sure in retrospect dame would like to have been part of all that right so the fact that mob james is now in the gangster chronicles and the gangster chronicles isn't doing all that well should make people think that maybe Y'all need to put Mob James back in the Gates of Christ. No, Mob James will never go back there. So that's it. It's over. No, I wouldn't. I couldn't deal with Norm. This is a dude I was calling my brother. This is a dude that I was giving him credit for helping me in, in, in when I was in a situation. You know what I'm saying? This is a guy I sat back and talked to on the phone. I had his back. I, if, if, if somebody touched you in front of me, Norm, we, this is what it is. And then the backstab shit, okay, man, I ain't got time for this type of shit. And then he didn't want me to know that he was, he done sold so many goddamn which columns of this company, shares of this company, he probably only got on 5% of the shit. He got like five or six motherfuckers, he done sold, sold uh, 30%. 25%, 15%. He probably don't even own shit of it. So this, this is why I don't do partnerships. I don't do shares. I don't do investments. Vlad TV is owned by Vlad, and it's right. nice and clean. Right. You come in, you get your check. You're not expecting anything on the back end because right. you're getting paid up front. And it makes it clean. Right. It makes it easy. And that's what I never got into that part of the business mm -hmm. where I was concerned about certain shit. So BJ... Uh, um, was telling me, man, this dude is this, this dude is that. That dude can't this and that with you. And I was like, okay, um, I got you. Let me see what's happening with Norm. And I should have listened to him, but I didn't. And we are where we are. So I, I think, and I think, you know, looking at it from the outside, looking in, if it was me, Let's just say that I had this idea to start the Gangster Chronicles. What I would say is, listen, I'm going to own it. And every time you do a show, you're going to get a nice check. And right. as the checks start improving, I'll slowly start, you know, get improving, more. improving you more. But I'm going to maintain the ownership so nobody has a weird kind of, you know, feeling that they're not getting what they should be getting or whatever else. At any point, anyone wants to leave, they can leave. But I'm gonna I'm gonna overlook it, and I'm gonna make sure everyone gets paid fairly. Right. If we had that understanding, yeah. I'd have been cool <clears throat> with it. I just think, walked I think away. The problem is sometimes when things when someone doesn't have a lot of money, things are just starting up. You start doing these partnerships, like you know, like uh, this happened with this other podcast. I am athlete. Mm -hmm. Like the dude that started it and and financed it. There was two other dudes that were sort of going along with it, and then when it started to blow up. They wanted a percentage. He didn't want to give a percentage, so they all left. So now that's, he got a. That's where he at. You see what I'm saying? That's and, what happened. And that's him. because he probably wasn't paying everyone back then. Right. So people were thinking, hey, I'm doing all this work for free. Now that things are going well, I want my percentage. And it's like, well, we never had that conversation. And now, you know, it's not going to be what it was. Right. This is why I've always just paid everybody. And, and this is why my relationships with people have always been so solid. Me and Boosie. We've been rocking for 20 years. Right. Boosie knows he fucks with me. That dude is hilarious, man. Yeah. He knows it's clean. Right. He knows he walks away with what I promised him. Right. And whatever happens to me is up to me. Right. If I win, if I lose, I'm not going to go back to him and say, hey, man, listen, that last interview didn't do well. Can you give me back half the money? No. Right. I'll never say that. Right. I take my L's and my wins 
you know? And, and this is, unfortunately, not everyone has a lot of business experience and understands this. Like, I did the same thing with that brother. That man asked me, could he borrow $3,000? Here. Who is this? Norm. Okay. You know, doing shit. I mean, I was under the impression we was good. And then when that last payment came, me and that brother ain't spoke a word. He won't call, he won't say shit to me. And I think that's pussy shit. But other than that, the only thing I can do at this point is get in trouble. Yeah. So I'm like, fuck it. It ain't worth it. The way I look at it sometimes is that sometimes you got to monetize your losses. Like back in the day, you know, I've said this a lot. You had a motherfucking problem. I'll say like this, back in the day, and I've said this before lots of times, people are going to be rolling their eyes right now who are regular Vlad TV viewers. I decided to, to become a drug dealer in my early 20s. Me and a guy who I thought was my homie, you know, I put up 17000 for a kilo of cocaine. He came over to my house with his son, cooked it up, made some comments, oh, something seems to be a little wrong with this or whatever, and then claimed that it was fake or whatever. But the, the bottom line is he ripped me off for that 17000 Right. I was angry for years about this. For years, because I couldn't do nothing about it. It was either do something violent or just take my L. I can't go to the police and say, this guy ripped me off for a kilo of cocaine. Right. And I remember talking to Freeway Ricky, and I, was, I said this for the first time on camera when I told him this, mm. and Freeway was like, well, you do know that if he didn't rip you off, you'd probably go to prison. And I said, shit, I never thought about it that way. Right, right. And I said, you know something? And then I remember I looked at that video and it made a bunch of money. And I said, you know something? I'm going to keep talking about this on my show. And over time, I've made more than 17000 off this there. loss. There it is, and there. me and this guy who I ran into once, whatever, 20 years ago in the club, he, no, no, I'm going to pay you, I'm going to pay you. And he never paid me, of course. If I ever see him again, man, squash that. I don't shit. care. Right. You can keep that seventeen thousand. You got your lick. You would have done way better not doing that and fucking with me because I was fucking with him. Right. Like if you would have stayed on my team and rolled with what I was doing, you would have made millions. But instead, you got that seventeen thousand. That was the last dollar you ever got from me, and I made way more than that talking about it. Right. You know, I'm gonna make a chunk just talking about it right now. Right. So at the end of the day. Instead of responding to your losses with violence or just being angry and bitter about it, figure out a way to make money off it. Well, like me personally, I really ain't tripping off of it. Yeah. I, you know, I'm not calling, texting, or none of that. It's just another part of my life. Now, I've been through this type of shit. I dealt with this shit. I dealt with it with Suge them. So I'm cool. And And like I said, I got more out of it than he's gonna get because I'm I'm still James McDonald. I'm still Mob James. Yeah. I still got my grandson. It's just me and him going on six six years. So I'm good. And I ain't I ain't gonna run around here telling people I'm mad at Norm, fuck Norm. But if 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 I ain't gonna let him off that easy though. But it is what it is. Well then you and Reggie have your own show together now. Well, me and Reggie do still bombing, but we do it a little here and there. You know, Reggie working out his shit and doing his shit, yeah. which I'm not even tripping off of that. Yeah, I showed up on bomb first. Yeah, if we a, a do. A little bit of me. You know what I'm saying? Oh, we had still bomb. We got still bombing. Yeah. Bomb first is Reggie's shit. I don't take yeah. nothing that ain't got nothing to do with me, but I just do me. Mm -hmm. uh, Vlad, I just, uh, you know, I'm enjoying my time with my grandson. Yeah. School, back, back home, just doing the backyard. He, we got a garden in our backyard. Nice. All kind of shit. You know, we do we do us. Yeah. So I'm cool with it. I ain't got no hard feelings with nobody. Just leave me the fuck alone. Well, uh, the city of Compton actually renamed one of his streets to, mm -hmm. to Easy E. That's Way, good. I think. That's good. That's cool. I mean, I ain't gonna, I ain't gonna shit on him, but I mean, all the Easy E, me, and every other gang member in Compton contribute to something. Mm -hmm. Now, what he did with his music and all that for him to be recognized and get a street sign, cool. 
I ain't gonna knock him for it. That's hey, give it to him. Just this do. Well, uh, Special Ed, the rapper, mm. did uh, Drink Champs recently, and I interviewed Special Ed about this as well. It's about to drop, and he felt that when N.W.A. entered hip hop, that it brought destruction. Well, maybe that's his opinion. It it it, it affected. People in Compton and all over the place a different way. When NWA came and said we had a voice because they was strictly on fuck the police shit, that's how everybody in the hood was feeling. So Special Ed, that's that's his opinion. Yeah. But get somebody else's point of view before you say some shit like that. The all the rap shit they got out today is is bullshit. Talking about killing, drinking, females, dogging the sisters out, or whatever. So, I, I don't even listen to that shit, man. I think that NWA was cold. I love NWA, man. I mean, at one point, I sort of got a little bored with hip hop, and then when I heard, you know, Easy E's first album, I was like, God damn, like this is so good. And that's like, crazy. From a, a motherfucker that didn't even know how to rap. Yeah. <sighs> But that, that's the genius of Dre. Right. To he take did that. I mean, in fact, Boys in the Hood, you know, if you watch the movie, and this actually happened because me and Yella talked about this, like Ice Cube had wrote that song for some East Coast group. Mm. And then they just weren't feeling the song. So they just like walked out. And then Dre was like, hey, Easy, why don't you try? Because Easy was financing everything. Right. Like, why don't you jump in the hoop in, in the booth and, and try this? And he finally convinced Easy to do it, and he had to just keep punching in, punching out, because Easy's real offbeat. Right. And he made a classic. Boys in the Hood was that song that launched NWA. Right. There was many songs afterwards, but if you take Boys in the Hood out of the equation, there's a reasonable chance that NWA would have just gone down as one of these underground, you know. Right. Uncle Jam's Army, or you know what I'm saying, or or or, or Egyptian Lover, which are which were very well respected groups out of L.A., but were very underground to this day. Right. There is no Uncle Jam's Army movie that's coming out. They're not going to be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and Egyptian Lover is not like still revered as one of the greatest albums of all time. And I'm fans of both these guys, so right. when they hear this, and I'm sure they will, don't think I'm dissing you guys. Right, you guys just didn't make that N.W.A. impact which is undeniable, which is what Boys in the Hood really triggered. But to be fair, I remember I interviewed Alonzo from the World Class Wrecking Crew, and he was heavily involved, you know, because right. Dre and Yellow was part of the, the Wrecking Crew originally. He did say this. He said that before NWA came out, he would throw these shows in L.A. all the time because he was a big promoter. He said there were a couple gangsters in the in the audience, and you know, shit would happen sometimes. But he said when after NWA became as big as they were in LA, it'd be like 70, 80 percent gangsters. And it really popularized it. And everyone wanted to wear black and everyone wanted to, you know. Even in our neighborhood, we listened to that. And and they were just speaking some real shit. And Everybody gravitated to that shit. Yeah. And, man, he had some good music. Great music. So kudos to him, man. He got a sign, a street sign. So kudos to him. Yeah. And then Tupac got a street sign recently also. Right. Tupac Shakur Way. I was actually supposed to be there, but life happened. <laughs> I wasn't able to go. Um, and I thought that was dope. Right. And uh, just recently, we lost um, C Knight from the Dove Shack. Don't know. You don't know who that is? No. I guess I won't even mention it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, Tupac getting his own street, his own Hollywood star, and everything else like that, I think is dope. Right. And it's just interesting how in 2023, there were so many hot artists that were around in 96, that had number one songs that you just don't even remember who they are anymore. We just pick and choose who we want to remember. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That's all that shit about. 
You know, you can't forget an Eazy-E. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Tupac Shakur, you can't forget a Tupac because of how he died or the music that he put out. You yeah. you 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 can't forget them. Some motherfuckers. Yeah. You know, so it's just a pick and choose who you want to remember, who you like, who you don't like. I mean, unfortunately, a lot of it comes with dying young. Because, I mean, Suge Shug even said this in his podcast. He said that you don't see Tupac with a beer belly and gray hair. Never and, will. Yeah. You saw him at his height. Good looking, shirt off. You know what I'm man, saying? How old was Tupac, man? 25. 25 years old, 25 man. 25 years old. I'm 50. He, he was half my age. Exactly. Man. 25. <sighs> And he got, and people still remember him. People, people still love him. Yeah. People still fighting over him. Yeah. Like what the people hell? People get arrested over him right now. Man, so twenty five years old. Man, come on, man. The average one of us ain't gonna see that. No, N none of us are gonna see it. Yeah. Tupac was special. He 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 was man. And the In body his own work, kind of way. Yeah, he was he was different. And um, you know. Me being part of the Tupac story, you know, I mean, because it's interesting to me. I mean, someone had pointed this out. I remember I was talking to Edie from the Outlaws, mm -hmm. and he was like, because I really got my start in hip hop when I made a Tupac mixtape. It was called Rap Phenomenon. Okay. It was me, Dirty Harry, and Green Lantern. Dirty Harry was Nas's DJ at the time, and Green Lantern was Eminem's DJ at the time. So me, this, I was the new, the new kid on the block. Okay. I put together this mixtape with these two guys and we took all these Tupac vocals and put different beats on them and then got all these other rappers to do verses like Alicia Keys and Busta Rhymes and um, Exhibit and Wyclef and whatever. And, turn, and it, it turned into, you know, we got mixtape of the year okay. back when they had the mixtape awards. And, um, you know, I, I remember when I first met Edie, he said, man, he said, you know how many of those mixtapes I signed my autograph on? Like, you know, it was like, because people would have them signed because it was right. such a big mixtape. And he was like, man, you went from, you know, from doing a Tupac mixtape to being involved in the solving of his murder is, you know. That, that's a lot. It's historical. Right. You know, like I'm now part of the Tupac story right. in my own way. And that brings a certain level of pride to who I am. Right. Because I remember when I first moved to L.A. in 2008, I was hanging out with this dude who was a crip who was like, he told me who killed Tupac. He was like, it was Orlando. I know him. Uh, you know, I, I know his people. This is what happened. And he even said, he's like, look, this is how it works, Vlad. You my homie. If we're walking down the street and a bunch of dudes jump on you and beat the shit out of you, I'll go grab my gun and go shoot at him. This is just how we operate. Right. Luckily, that never had to happen. But he's like, this, and that's what happened that night. A whole bunch of dudes jumped on somebody who was, you know, unlike me, an actual gang member. Right. <laughs> and they went and got their gun and they retaliated. I've been telling you that. And, and, this, is, and this is what happened. That's the way and it And now, as we can see with this Keefe situation, it's now on paperwork right. as to what happened. And, you know, we'll see. I don't wish, you know, and, and people ask me, like, this is why I'm not cooperating with, with Las Vegas PD because my goal is not, was never to put Keefe in jail. Right. I don't want Keefe in jail. If Keefe was found not guilty, walked away, I think that would be great. Yeah, and let him and go and live yeah. his life. Let me, he's a 61-year-old 60, man. Let I don't want to see Keefe in jail. It brings me no pleasure that Keefe is locked up right now. When people would ask, how do you feel? I said, I don't feel any type of way. I had solved the case four years ago in my mind. I put it out there. Right. The fact that laws, because I remember like people around me like, yo, like, yo, Keefe just got arrested. Yo, this is crazy. Like, I didn't really realize until people like Pierce Morgan started calling me up for interviews and shit. Like, like oh, people really care about my role this much? Yeah. But to me, it was just, I didn't care. Right. You know? Like I said, I hope Keefe walks away from this and lives off the rest of his life. But we don't know what's going to happen. It's not in my hands. But the other day, I'm tied into the Tupac story my way. You're tied into the Tupac story in your way. Suge is tied into his way. 
And ultimately, the way that we've gone about it is where we leave ourselves or where we are right now to this day. Well, I just think there's time to let that man rest. Yeah. And and whatever happens with Keefe D, he win or lose, it's over. Yeah. All the other guys are gone. It's over. You know what I'm saying? And and all these people on the social media can let that shit go. Yeah. That's how we're going to end it. Mob James, always a pleasure. Until all next time. time. Peace. All the time.